Power Athlete Radio. The very coach that helped shape John's NFL career through strength and conditioning is back again. Rafael Ruiz checks in with the Power Athlete HQ crew to discuss his latest venture in working with youth athletes and developing a program and culture that will yield future champions. He started by introducing these young bucks to two simple concepts, accountability and expecting more from themselves. The crew kicks it with Master Splinter, covering trends in training, how high school programs have evolved, and of course, a few stories from way, way back. Raf has never minced words when it comes to the industry of strength and conditioning. His guidance and experience has enabled top-notch coaches like our very own Tex McQuilkin to approach their job from a science and performance standpoint. Our hats are forever tipped to Raf for developing CrossFit football alongside of John and the crew, traveling, coaching, and blowing some of the first minds ever, including my own, during the early years of the CrossFit football program. This is episode 166. Our Athlete Nation, what is up? You got Luke, John, and Tex in one steamy, stinky room here in SoCal, giving you another episode of Power Athlete Radio, the world's premier strength and conditioning podcast. I figure if we say it enough, people will believe it. Well, you know, I believe it was Adolf Hitler said, if you're going to tell a lie, tell a simple one, tell a big lie, and keep telling it over and over again, and eventually the masses will believe you. And for our regular listeners, they've probably heard that exchange right there like six or seven times. (laughs) Well, I've never, I, I mean, I've used the quote before, but I've actually never told the listeners that it was Adolf Hitler that I got that quote from because, you know, there's some negative connotations with saying, <laughs> I, you know, and I mean, you can quote Nietzsche, you can quote Stalin, you can quote a lot of people, but you quote Hitler and oh, all of a sudden you're everybody, about, oh, everybody gets offended. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're excited to have uh, have our guest on the show today. We got Raf Ruiz, aka Raz Al Ghul, League of Shadows, aka Master Splinter, aka all sorts of AKAs. Raz, well, it's, Raf, what's it's going because on? he changes his brand every other day. So I don't know what the brand would be. Like uh, it was Axis, and then like I saw it see, I'm back. I'm back in TFR 1441. That was my I first. Well, that was the evolution of strength condition. Yeah, dude. And then now, where are we at now, Raf? <laughs> It's actually Sword and Soul Solutions. That's uh, the overreaching. We were, uh, I was trying to figure out what would be an umbrella that everything, that I could kind of funnel everything into because you're right. And nobody knows what it is. And nobody knows. So it's Perfect. so obscure and, and, and the logo is pretty legit too. So I could just basically say S3 and it's, it's good. I like it. Makes sense. Everyone loves the acronym. Well, what I really like is trained heroically. No, you like that? <laughs> <laughs> I literally saw it and I was like, oh, Ruiz. Oh. Like a comedy star. Well, let's do this. Let's, I mean, if, um, again, if people yeah, don't I'll, know how you know Ruiz, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll give. Um, you know, uh, years ago when I was a bright eyed young NFL player, I, I met this bright eyed young strength coach who I realistically didn't realize was probably a year older than me when I showed up there. But Roth got recommended. I, I was living in Tampa, Florida, and I called my agent. I said, hey, I need to find somebody to train with. He called me back, and he gave me a phone number and a name of this guy, Roth Ruiz. So I show up, go to meet Roth. Um, Roth, I'm still not really sure if Roth's 19 or 75 <laughs> because he hasn't necessarily <laughs> changed. And um, – which is ironic because when I met Roth's mom, I wasn't, I was like, is his sister or his mom or his grandmother? They all kind of look the same. <laughs> but so I meet Roth and uh, we start training and uh, Roth had no equipment. I think all we had was some PVC and some TheraBand and some hurdles. And he broke me the fuck off and uh, ended up, that was the beginning of our relationship. And we trained together for geez, most of my NFL career. And, um, and then I remember it was like about a year into it when I realized Roth was like a year or two older than me. And I was like, Fuck, I have a, I'm a dipshit. If uh, <laughs> if I had realized this guy's only a year old, than me, I probably would have been like, no, no, I, I got to find somebody at least. Yeah, another, a little more seasoned. Season, yeah, a little seasoned. But um, uh, it ended up being uh, probably one of the best experiences because not only did I learn a lot, but uh, you know, I was really able to enter a system that allowed me to flourish into the player that I really was, and I, I owe a lot of uh, my NFL success to Rafael. And um, just in terms of the knowledge. And so uh, that and many of the funniest stories in my life happened to stem around Raphael. So, <laughs> so Raph, do we have to tiptoe around anything now? Well, like, yeah, uh, we can't say anything. Like, remember last time you were on the podcast and all of a sudden you like called me? Uh, so-and-so said something. Well, yeah. well, I believe it was the Spartan baby comment that got him in trouble. <laughs> it was actually a number of things. I think it was uh, – I, I think it was everything from the, the, the miscue of, of – 
you know, having a good time at night, you know, having a couple of beers and, and some wings and, and, um, and just being young and stupid, you know, it's, it's, it's the whole pussification of America where you can't relay your, your life story. And I said, listen, guys, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to be the first person to tell you that, you know, we had fun. We had a good time and I'm not going to not tell people to have some fun, you know, learn, if anything, learn from our mistakes, you know? Yeah. Okay. Maybe it wasn't the smartest idea. We, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have drowned the old Bronco, but, you know, <laughs> well, looking back, it was a great time. Before yeah, PETA well, gets well, out of us, Bronco well, is a model of a car. So and what it, happened was – You guys didn't uh, wrangle an actual Roth horse. and I went out and we got some wings. Driving home, it started raining. And everybody that's ever lived in Florida, uh, it's pretty much a swamp. So everything looks dry. You have, like, one drop of rain, and next thing, everything floods. There were big puddles. So Roth was like, uh, let's splash some stuff and I get that one. So I was driving through these monster puddles. And covering the car, all of a sudden we see the biggest puddle, and I'm like, "We're on it!" Well, I'm going to hit it, and don't realize it's like an eight foot deep drainage ditch. <laughs> As I go straight in, we go wham! I eat my '92 Ford Bronco in this drainage ditch, and all of a sudden, water is like coming up. Like we literally jump out and swim for our lives. As I'm outside, being like, "It's like late at night, pitch black, don't know," and we're like, "Oh shit! Like, how are we going to get this thing out of here?" You know, like we're going to call the police, tow truck, whole deal. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, these like rednecks. I mean, like I'm talking like lifted pickup, yeah. like mutter truck, like literally the tractor tires, rednecks, Confederate flag. I see them coming. I'm thinking like, oh shit, we're dead now. Like you boys stuck? They're like, yeah. Dude throws like a chain out, hooks up the Bronco and drags us out, and literally <laughs> in the Bronco fires up, and we take her home. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was uh, probably one of the funnier things. I mean. Dude, if these uh, if these hillbillies hadn't shown up, dude, uh, that thing would still be stuck there. Like, oh my god! So it was a good. Uh, like we heard a puddle splash. Yeah. Came to help out. Yeah. Well, no, they, <laughs> these guys were driving around just looking for mud to take in their mud truck. Yeah. And uh, I mean, they had like fifty four inch tires, and they were like skinny, like a tractor tires. Pretty Someone's hilarious. looking over you. Yeah. So somebody looked out for us, but uh, yeah. So that that story got Roth in trouble. So yeah, we, <laughs> we told that story. But you know, the, the better part is, I mean, Roth and I were probably twenty five, twenty six years old. At I mean, this was like, yeah, like, like the good old days. This is a long time ago. So yeah. like, we were reliving these stories. Like, I, I, I the irony of this is, uh, I feel like uh, Ralph and I grew up together, mm -hmm. and that we did kind of grow up together. And um, you know, for that time in our lives, so I mean, it was uh, it was pretty cool. And um, you know, everything from having to live in the uh, uh, Raphael's girlfriend's house, which was literally like the Skittle House. Yeah, the Skittle House. Dude, she painted every wall and door a different pastel color. So the whole house was just different pastels. Like it looked like a bowl of Skittles. <laughs> I like slept in her back room and all I had in my room was, four was different a bed. colored walls. No, it was a bed. Oh, I had, it was a bed and a fridge and a yeah. refrigerator because uh, she was uh, kind of odd about her food. So I had to have my own fridge because she would like flip out if she saw that too much, too much food. <laughs> it was good but i mean so so like that you know that's kind of how we know roth and uh um, unfortunately we got on a podcast and we started kind of reliving some of these stories and the people roth was working at uh got a little upset with him so that was unfortunate so we were sorry about that oh well i don't think there was any uh, apologies necessary i think it was uh, like i said um the certain organization was just really concerned about offending too many people and i said you know what uh, in all honesty uh, this th this should be learning experiences for everybody, for the listeners, for for all you people think who are offending somebody. Absolutely, just learn from it. This is a uh, you know I'm not ashamed of anything I've ever done, you know, and I'll be the first person to admit some mistakes. So you know, keep you from rolling it, rolling your Bronco in a ditch. Learn from my mistakes. Yeah, like when it starts raining in Florida, don't go around splashing puddles. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that's at night. At night, but in the day, you know, <laughs> you can get away with it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we didn't know it was a drainage ditch. I mean, you know. But uh, so, Ralph, what are you up to now, man? Oh, big things. We've got. Um, um actually, went once I got done with that contract, I uh, we packed packed the family. We moved back to uh, Florida, back to the old stomping grounds, and um, I was kind of weighing some options out trying to figure out what i wanted to do and um you know uh, lord jesus christ shined down a bright light on me and uh, we had a coach who runs a a school here in tampa uh, berkeley preparatory school uh, it's a, a absolutely beautiful beautiful campus 
And um, he had said uh, he had heard for, for a number of years about a, a lot of awesome things that we were doing. And he was asking um, if, if there was potential for me to do the string dishing at the school. And um, I went and took a look at it. I hadn't been there in years. This is one of those um, really, really upscale, you know, $30,000 a year kind of uh, uh, private schools. Um, I get there and um, lo and behold that, you know, that $30,000 a year, you know, built them out some beautiful, beautiful facilities, everything from um, really nice pool, weight room, uh, the, the whole nine yards, all of their athletic facilities, new track, new everything. Um, and there's no string dishing coach there. And uh, so, uh, and, and when I say, that. yeah, imagine that. And, and when I say a nice facility, um, you know, being around the, the game long enough, their facilities are, I would say, better than 90 to 95% of most colleges in the country. Wow. And, um, and, and the kicker for me, the selling point was um, this school starts at kindergarten all the way through 18 years old. And I said, you know what, you give me an opportunity to develop an athlete from, you know, basically Raiders age to 18. I said, I'm in. I said, this is a, um, I, I've never even entertained this idea, never even entertained this thought, you know, because I've always been like, hey, college is. You mean you're a gogi? You're basically I, setting up the Rafael Ruiz a gogi? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is genius. And so now I go did, in. Did, did there. you tell them, do you guys, like, do you realize what you're asking me to do? Are you guys okay with this? And they're like, yeah, we just need you to come as a strength conditioning coach. And you're like, oh, wow, what? <laughs> so are you going to be moving to Tampa and putting the kids in? Uh... No, I'm just going to drop them off in Tampa and then go back to Texas. <laughs> yeah, Rob, Rob uh, we, uh, we sold the house here and uh, we, we rented a place and now we're trying to figure out where we can move and go to Tampa. And I mean, not Tampa, but uh, Texas. Austin. That's and, awesome, brother. And be able to, you know, actually find some land and not live uh, like, I, I guess you could say, uh, uh, like a bunch of fucking Oreos stacked in a container. I mean, that's like what we live out here. It's just so tight. So mm -hmm. you know, we go out there and get some room. Uh, Rob's actually from Colleen, so not far from there. And we actually yeah. do adventures in Tampa or in uh, Austin as well. And Absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah, but the, uh, so, so is, uh, but here's the $64,000 question is, is, uh, are they going to let Raider go to school there? Um, if you are tenured in X amount of years, uh, for every year that you're there, they give you a, a uh, they cut off a bigger percentage of, um, and at $30,000 a year, I'm going to have to invest a lot of time until I can put them into a position and be able to afford that. But absolutely. Nice. So that's the goal is to, I got to figure that there's got to be a positive to my skill set. Um, I haven't found one yet. And <laughs> when these guys present that, I'm like, Oh, thank God. You're like, <sighs> you're like, you Oh, yeah, I, um, oh boy. How many yeah. kids go to school there, Ralph? Um, I don't remember the total number, but uh, the beautiful part about it is um, they take a holistic approach. There's 80% participation in sports, so all of the kids are involved in sports in some shape, form, or fashion. Where is um, it? It's uh, west, so it's uh, near the causeway, near 60. Oh. So right off of the uh, Clearwater exit area over there. Really, over near like where we used to live in Safety Harbor, yeah, but on the other side, on Tampa side. Oh, on Tampa side, wasn't there? Um, uh, uh, was it? Um, what was that? Bahama Breeze. Yeah. So basically, it's it's um, you can probably throw a rock at it from from Bahama Breeze. It's that close to that. Oh, so wow. right off of, uh, the big golf course Memorial Highway. So, but it's an it's an older established place. It's yeah. I, know. I I remember seeing the name. Um, we used to live uh, where we where we trained was in Tampa, and we used to live on the other side of the causeway. And uh, the causeway was our, actually our racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> and because because here's the best part is like the causeway. There's like no police. I mean, they're either like like because there's nowhere for them to hide. It's just like you know like yeah. multiple lanes. Is that, that, did you ever go on the causeway? Uh, I'm sure we sprinted it sometime. <laughs> no, dude. Literally, we we would get out there, and I'd like let Roth get in front of me, and dude, I would wind up that Porsche and be like. Oh, <laughs> Rob had this uh this Tundra truck that was like TRD'd out. Oh yeah, it was pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah, it was flying. So yeah, we we had a lot of fun. Every day was like we put on shake and bake. Oh, dude, drive so fast. Hey, one seventy. 
sorry, that was a joke. <laughs> Don't get in any trouble. Yeah, 95. Yeah, 95. Uh, but that's awesome, dude. Um, the uh, So 80% participation in sports, you obviously have, uh, you, know, fi- you know, people that are willing to invest in their children, you know, if they're putting them in that type of stuff. And then, like, what's the, uh, what's the rate of return? Or really, like, is it like a, a charter school and that they're, you know, uh, 97% putting these kids in Ivy League? I mean, is it that kind of deal? It is. It is. They're, um, you know, these are all the, the, the cream of the crop kind of kids. They're all fighting for those, those Harvard spots, those Yale spots. Um, and the crazy thing is I went in with the perception that uh, because these are more affluent people that they, that I would have to babysit these kids that I would have to kind of pamper them. But um to my surprise from day one, I mean, these are all kids of type A personality parents and they're driven academically. Yeah. yeah. Um, And and it's one of those issues where now I just have to convince them to take that same work ethic and and drive it in. And I really haven't had to do much of that. It's, it's been smooth sailing where they've hung on every word and they are, um, they're just go getters. You just have to, uh, you know, teach them to read a, a different book as opposed to what they've been doing. So, like the anti millennials, almost. Absolutely. I mean, so I, the opposite of Ben Oliver. Absolutely. Ooh, shots fired. <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> uh, well, we got a lot of history. You got to remember, Roth and I went on the road with Ben because uh, I used to, uh, I used to mess with Ben anytime we had a room together. I just instantly knew it up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, oh yeah, no, no. I mean, <laughs> literally, as soon as we would walk in, which was uh, I, I told you guys the story about when uh, I was a freshman in college, um, and I had a guy named Todd Stewart, and he came in and instantly just nuded up and sat on the bed with sunglasses and just w- would hang out in sunglasses naked the entire time. And like I remember being there and being like, it's kind of weird, and I didn't realize he was fucking with me. And uh, uh, the best part I told you is um, for bed check, he like all of a sudden, he's like, looks he's like, what time is it? And I'm like, oh, it's, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever, like 9.58. He's like, okay, hold on. So he gets up, he makes his bed like perfectly. And he's and, like, uh, he's like, move over. And he gets into bed and we're both like <laughs> sitting in the same bed. Sure enough, the coach comes in at 10 o'clock for bed check. <laughs> and, like, and like, we're both like sitting up in bed, like laying there with our shirts off, you know, with the covers up, like both underneath the same bed watching TV. And like the coach walks in and is like, just check it on. He just walks away. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the dude was such a dick. Um, I mean, like he he was just fucking. I smoked too much pot, but uh, um, it's funny dude. Like he was really, really funny. He had a theory that if you watch Fletch enough times, eventually you could become funny just watching Fletch. Mm-hmm. And so he watched Fletch a lot. And so like, that's where that yeah. theory comes from. Yeah, the, the whole Irwin F. Fletcher thing with Todd Stewart. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a uh, that was a funny deal. So I don't even know how I got a hope, Ben Oliver. Yeah. So, yeah. but uh, so rough. Like uh, you, so now you're the kind of the strength conditioning coach. Uh, how many teams? Uh, like how many sports? And are children really ready for Rafael Weiss? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think the uh, uh, I mean, we talked about the evolution of strength conditioning. I think the whole point is to avoid a lot of the pitfalls that we're running into now. Um, you you go across the board any successful program the first thing you have to do is change the culture um now i'm walking into a situation where i don't change anything i'm building a culture you know i walk in the first day and it's hey guys we're, we're going to learn two concepts number one is accountability we're, we're going to figure out who your super friends are you're going to be accountable to them and number two i said we're going to change your expectations of yourself and those two things we've been harping on them over the last two weeks, I mean, the last two months, and it's just everything that they do, it's like, oh, my God, I swam this. Okay, well, expect more, expect more, expect more. And it's, it's been unbelievable to watch a two-month change um, in these young athletes where, you know, the nine years old, 10 years old, and now all of a sudden where I would walk in, you know, before when they would show up for practice, they kind of went into this wrestling room and they were supposed to stretch I mean, it was hurting cats. I mean, they're, they're all over the place. They're up the wall. They're on their phone. Um, and now, two months later, I've got, you know, nine-year-olds leading stretches. And it's just an amazing thing to watch, you know, just in such a short amount of time, that transformation where, you know, let's start with the basics. Now I don't have to worry about cramming as much as I can into four years. 
because now I can win the war and say, listen, you know, you're nine years old. My concern, and we've got some guys that have some legitimate promise here where um, you look at the development of a of any athlete, and we talked about this before the show, is during those, those uh, early years where everybody looks like they're going to be world class and what happens at puberty, their growth spurt isn't what they thought it was going to be. And then the parents are like, oh, wow, you know, you're really talented at 12. Um, but now you're only five five, and there's clearly not going to be much room on an NFL roster for you. Well, now we're getting these same kids, and they're showing a lot of promise. And I look at this, I look at this kid who is number one in the state and number like four or five in the country in freestyle, and his dad walks in and he's six five, and I'm thinking, go ahead and get ready for the Olympics, kid, because you're just going to keep growing. I've got a girl that's twelve. And she, she's looking down on me. I'm thinking you are going to be phenomenal one day because she's same thing. She's rated really high in the state, really high in the country. And her dad is a massive, massive man. Uh, Mom is fairly tall, I think, but I'm thinking the whole time is there's a lot of other athletes like you at that age, but none of them are going to be that same dimensions as you. So it's just amazing to be able to walk this journey with these guys. Well, yeah. And also, I mean, um, what these kids don't realize is they're actually getting uh, exposure to a strength conditioning program that has been really crafted over the course of decades uh, of training, you know, some of the, you know, the highest level athletes on the planet. I mean, you know, geez, I, 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 like I still, you know, am fortunate, you know, to be able to like look back on some of the things we did in the early days when we had our training groups down in Tampa with Jeff and those guys. And, uh, you know, just some of those little things, I mean, to still be able to take some of that stuff. And, and it's, it's interesting, too. I mean, we had a, uh, a kid want to come train with us who's getting ready to go to USC and who literally was like, oh, yeah, I'm it. he was out, you know. And it's, it's pretty funny to, like, put people in these situations and see how they react and, you know, see who really wants it. And then having been and stood on that other side and seen so many people fail. And, you know, I mean, it's just it, it's pretty easy to kind of see – you know, after you've been exposed to it, been around it, trained in the groups, had people, and when people come in and you're like, dude, these are all the things you need to do. If you can't do this, then you're wasting your time. So, I mean, you know, now here's a situation where you get to almost, instead of that kind of, a, you know, uh, kind of sink or swim, you get a chance to kind of bring them along at a much better rate so that all of a sudden when they're 15, 16, 17, they'd already been exposed and you don't have to do that kind of deal. Oh, my God. I'm, that, that's exactly the point is I'm sitting there thinking about all the – you know, the, those struggles that you have, you know, when I was at University of Tampa, it was always funny to me where I would have four years with athletes and there would be a 10% of them that really, you know, would roll their eyes and be like, yeah, why do I have to do this kind of thing? Um, and it never failed one to two years after they graduate or they get drafted by baseball. And next thing you know, they're coming back and like, hey, Raph, what do I do to work on my flexibility? Hey, Ralph, what do I do to get faster? What do I do to get strong? I'm like, oh, really? It's the same stuff that I've been trying to, you know, basically tug on you and pull your hair to get to do for the last four years. Um, but now, just like you said, I can take them and slowly progress them and just basically build habits. I mean, they don't even know it. And, you know, I mean, we're just slowly working through. And so now it ends up being a situation where, you know, my 12-year-old superstars right now, I said, literally, you know, you're in a perfect world scenario where, you and your buddy, both of them are 12, 13 years old, and they're the top rated swimmers um, in the state, and they're ranked in the nation. And I go, you guys need to understand, nowhere in the world does this happen where you get two gifted swimmers. It would be like Ryan Lochte and Michael Phelps growing up together. That's how gifted these two guys are. And I go, go, you guys need to become best friends. You need to go straight stepbrothers and become best friends Mm -hmm and hang out because you're going to ride, you know, the next two to three Olympics together all the way to wherever those things might be. Well, wouldn't arch, wouldn't arch nemesis work as well? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's kind of how it is. One, mm-hmm. and, you know, there's like that. One of them is a little bit less, you know, just slightly less talented. One of them's a little bit better athlete. The other one is uh, mentally wired a little bit different where he wants to mm-hmm. constantly push and push and push. Um, so they, they kind of feed off of each other. And um, that's perfect. Right now, Right now, one of them is, has lost all summer to the other one. And you can see he's just getting frustrated, but it's not stopping his work ethic. He's mm-hmm. still driving on. So how many sports are at the school? 
I think there's 16, but I'm, I'm fighting tooth and nail not to do. I, I, I'm trying to do the least amount as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they've got a football team that is, um, uh, they're kind of down on hard times, but you know, it's a 40, 45 man roster, what they carry. And I'm like, wow, that is aggressive. Uh, you know, they just, uh, are they playing 11 uh, or eight man? <clears throat> it's 11. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're struggling. <clears throat> so are you going to go in and work with football as well? I don't know. Um, my perfect world scenario is uh, the school and club swimming, and I would like to do the same thing with track and field um, in terms of just speed development because then that opens up a lot of doors for the other sports where I don't have to do football and basketball. I'm saying, hey, if you want to get faster, you know, like in Texas, that was a requisite was, Hey, if you play football, your off season was go run track. Yeah. Are you a speed coach? Do you know how to teach people to run faster? Mm, yeah. Can you get them slower? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's where we're looking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I need mean, to slow these people down. What I need, I need a coach that can make you slower. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Hold on. We already know that guy. So that's the, that's the best world scenario for me is to be able to, to do those because it's a, you know, I'd like to see some of these kids truly get put up on the Olympic trials board and eventually, you know, go down the road. That's that's kind of where uh, I'd like to push it. You know, football is just kind of played out. It just takes so long. It's such a hard, difficult road for them. Well, that and it's just such a uh, – But the sport coaches know everything. Well, the thing with football, and, and I'm sure why Rob's kind of gravitated towards going, you know, with swimming and some of these other Olympic sports is I think uh, uh, football is so saturated. Um, with not only coaches, but everybody, yeah, like you said, everybody knows everything. Yeah, the there's so much fucking dogma. Like, um, Tex and I were laughing, uh, there's a, a strength coach that wrote a book and I, I, you know, somebody recommended it. So I bought it. And as I'm reading through it, the guy's like <laughs> talking about these concepts, um, as if he invented them. And I was kind of laughing, uh, cause I was like, I, I can't believe, you know, this guy is talking about, you know, training eccentric and concentric and isometric contractions independently. I'm like, oh, wow. groundbreaking. Yeah, groundbreaking. And he's writing about these things as if, like, you know, he's talking about, uh, you know, um, uh, rep degeneration over time with certain percentages. And I'm like, wow, at 80%, you can't squat five perfect reps. I mean, you can squat three. It just was like, like uh, that's the shit with, uh, with street coaching, but also football, where it's like, it's so saturated. Everybody knows so much that really, you know, it's, it's impossible to do it. But yet, you get into a situation with swimming where, you know, like, the application of ground-based training to swimming is archaic. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I remember you called me, you were like, dude, I, uh, you know, I can't believe these guys are this far behind and now you have a situation to go through. Uh, we were just in Madrid this weekend for a seminar and got a chance to watch the European um, track championships. Oh, awesome. And, uh, uh, you know, like what sucks in America is the only time you ever get like sports like swimming or any of those stuff is around the Olympics. Mm -hmm. They're never on. But like, dude, we sat there for, you know, at least two, three hours each day and watched all the, uh, the track stuff. And to me, watching the track stuff is almost better than watching any other sport. I mean, dude, like to watch like the four by 100, the, the hurdles. I mean, we were even watching steeplechase and I was excited. Yeah. Uh, but just like watching like the body control and the jumpers, I mean, uh, unbelievable. And watching those dudes throw the hammer. Yeah. Oh my God. Hammer and javelin are two dude, of my favorite things to watch. Dude, yeah. uh, the hammer throwers, like, like their rotation and the acceleration that these guys have. And then, uh, and, and then also, uh, um, uh, basically trying to find Texas suitable mates. Oh yeah. Number uh, four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Irish, Irish sprint team. I'm all in. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the Irish sprinters. I mean, the other one were, um, Greece, yeah, Greece was uh, had some amazing pole vaulters. I mean, dude, like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, and the pole vaulting, we we've also and Ralph will appreciate this. So we sat down and over a couple beers, we tried to decide what is the single most difficult event in track and field. Like, if 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 you had to like put like a level of like, okay, if sprinting, even though it takes a, a tremendous physical effort and it's technical, if you could put like uh, a, you know, like technicality, like, you know, that's a level 10, a four, a three. I mean, sprinting would probably be a four because, you know, you just get a fast guy, let him go straight down the field. Uh, you know, hurdles. All right. That's like a seven, a high jump high would jump. probably be an eight. And then we realized the number 10 pole vault, pole vault, right? Run as fast as you can with what, like an 18 foot fiberglass pole, <laughs> but it's I literally sprint, put it in a hole, like the size of like, size of a, like, a like Luke's butthole. Right? 
pint glass. <laughs> yeah, like pint glass. <laughs> right? And then hold on to it as you lean back and catapult yourself over a bar that's anywhere from like, you know, 16 to 20 feet in the air. No problem. And then like actuate your body over it and then not fucking break your neck on the landing. Or land on the fucking pole. Yeah, or or impale yourself. Rob, Rob was a pole vaulter in college, in high school, right? Yep. And uh, I like to just watching all the different sports. I mean, dude, like the uh, the high jump, the contempt, like the ability is like, but pole vault, fucking unbelievable. The, but the beauty of watching that level of track is everything's a highlight reel. So yep. it was <laughs> it was uh, event yeah. after event after event, and we were just on the edge of our seat for two three hours. It was awesome. Yeah. I mean, John, did uh, you see uh, Vashti Cunningham in the uh, women's? So for Team USA, she made the Olympic team. Uh, Randall Cunningham's daughter. Yes, yes, yeah. No, I, I, unbelievable. Yeah, I, I watched it. Uh, and the other one is um, the uh, the shot putter who was the D tackle for the Niners. I think his daughter. Yeah. The top female shot putter. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I can't remember his name. Uh, it's, <laughs> Okay. It was out of Texas. Yeah, he yeah. was at Texas, and he played for the 49ers. Uh, he's older than me. I, I didn't play against him, but I knew who he was coming up. Um, and like he, like his daughter is like a beast, and she, she's like the, the the most dominant thrower out there. So it was pretty exciting. But yeah, Randall Cunningham is his uh, daughter's coach. coach. Yeah. And so he started a uh, a track team. Uh, like I, I forgot where he lives, but uh, in, in Vegas. In Vegas, that's right. He started this track club. Uh, because he wanted competition for his kids and all this, because his son and his daughter, he like selected them as high jumpers, and his daughter straight up looks like a gazelle. Oh yeah, she's like six foot, maybe six one, maybe about a buck fifteen. She's <laughs> like this big, and dude, she literally floated over that sucker. It's pretty exciting to watch him. Uh, you know, obviously being, I, I met Randall a few times. I haven't played in Philly, but uh, yeah, no, I was super excited to see that. It's crazy when you, uh, you know, this Olympics, especially with swimming as well as track and field, the changing of the guard, a lot of the guys that, you know, that over the last eight years, even 12 years, you know, they've kind of have, have passed the torch where you've got a 16 year old Sydney McLaughlin who is representing the U S in the 400 meter hurdles. Um, and that was just an absolute, she runs a, you know, she's basically finishes third, but she's 16 years old. Um, and she basically beats, um, if she was in college, she would have won NCAAs um, as a 16-year-old. And, and just to watch her level of professionalism and her, and her speed, it was just absolutely amazing to see that. Rock, where is she out of? Uh, maybe the New Jersey area, I want to say. She goes to a uh, private school, like a Union Catholic or something like that. I'm surprised. I mean, to have somebody that fast, not out of Texas or California, or California. I mean, it's, it's almost like, uh, the speed States are Florida, Texas, and California, mm -hmm. like yeah. the fastest runners. I mean, cause dude, if, um, you know, Rob, Rob will take cause he's from there, but, uh, the Texas relays is like the most insane thing. I mean, you want to talk about like uh, a cultural event, like, like the Texas relays will have, I mean, shit, how, how many people will show up to that? 50,000? It's bigger than the Olympics because it's open all the way from high school. So they've got basically the Olympians, then there's a college division. So high level NCAA and then high level high school. So, I mean, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of athletes there. So what is it about those geographic areas? Um, uh, you know what? Any gut feeling? Culture. I mean, yeah, it's culture. It's kind of like uh, football. I mean, like, you know, like the word football is uh, is almost like uh, a holy word in Texas. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, like it, it's almost like God, football, guns, barbecue. <laughs> I love it. Let's go. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, like, like I mean, Texas, it, it, it's kind of like, uh, I, you know, uh, growing up in California, I mean, and, and uh, you know, Unfortunately, you guys kind of remember a little bit, but like pre-internet days, uh, growing up in California, like the only way that we ever knew anything about any other st was, you know, newspaper. Or there was like a Cal High Sports magazine that got sent to the house. And I remember like there was always like, you know, you see like the national rankings. And, like, yeah, the all, USA Today. Yeah. I mean, it was always Texas teams. Mm -hmm. And like it was Texas, California. And there was like an occasional in Northern California. But there was always this like kind of, uh, you know almost like romantic deal where like, you know, you hear about Texas football and it's because of Bear Bryant and like just this, you know, I mean, it's, it's all people do. I mean, you know, Tex talks about, you know, playing football in high school and uh, the running back on my brother's team is from Katie. 
Oh, um, nice. yeah. So, I mean, like just, you know, Texas football is an institution. Sure. Whereas in California it is too. I mean, um, everybody plays. So I, I think um, it just, you know, and where you have good football, you're going to have good sprinters because most of the guys play both. Yep. You know, and so, I mean, you know, and you, you look at how many good NFL running backs have come out of Florida. Mm-hmm. That's another one. I mean, Florida probably, I, I bet you if you looked at, and I'm sure somebody has this information, if you look at Florida, Texas, and California in terms of NFL players, it has to be 70%. 65, 70%. And it's, I mean, um, it goes down to like Dan John when we were talking to him, geog- uh, geography and genetics, right? And it just is like the, the two are aligned in those areas. Whereas, and I mean, because East Coast is densely populate, populated, but they're, I mean, what are they doing out there? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, look, look at Michael Bick and all those guys all came out of like Virginia Beach. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were all based out of that area. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's good guys that come out of that part of like Virginia, which is really kind of the South. But for the most part, I mean, I think at one point, um, like there on, when I played in Philly, there was like four or five guys on our team that had all played in Florida high school football against each other. Yeah. It was like uh, Pat Sertan, Al Harris, Trey Thomas. Uh, I mean, and I'm, I'm forgetting a few others, but like all those dudes were all like from like Papano Beach, D Land, like they were all from literally Florida. And uh, I mean, it, it, and it was a pretty big number. And then there's like a bunch of dudes from California and a bunch of guys from Texas. Mm-hmm. And I remember we were sitting in our locker room, I think in Kansas City, and like the amount of dudes that were like, had, you know, it was like Priest Holmes, uh, Tony Gonzalez, Brian Waters, myself. I mean, like all the, you know, all these guys were either from, you know, the, it, it, was, it was pretty interesting, the numbers. I'm sure somebody has a statistic on it. But it just, it's kind of how it works. I mean, you know, like uh, like Roth will tell you in Texas, like sprinting, Texas relays. If you were in high school and you run in Texas relays, that's like being on the mantle of the whole deal. I mean, Roth ran in Texas relays. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's a big deal. Well, I mean, basically, you look at it, and like I said, it, in my high school, if you were on varsity football, it was mandated that you ran track. So if, if that is not a cultural institution within the state of Texas, if you are somewhere else, that is a pool of people that potentially can all run or develop speed. So if you're in Illinois and they don't require that, I mean, they're begging people to come run track versus here, we've got a 70 man roster and they don't care what position you play, you're running track because that is your conditioning. And next thing you know, they see, you know, 12 people run really fast and be like, wow, that's great. As opposed to the coach trying to run through the hallway screaming, Hey, can anybody run? You know, and, and that becomes the big difference. So, I mean, people, and I joke about this all the time from Texas where my senior year, it was, they granted me work study, you know, my schedule. So my first period I had off because they wanted me to sleep in. And then second period was home ec where we cooked breakfast and so they scheduled home ec so i would sleep in come in an hour later and they would cook breakfast football varsity football was your third period so if you made the varsity football team you were automatically given third period football fourth period was track i mean was lunch so that's the first half of my day was sleep eat football and then go eat lunch And then I had like some sort of math class and then some sort of history class. And then it, you got varsity track. Like if you were a varsity letterman, seventh period. So your seventh period was automatically assigned as varsity track. And I remember to this day where, you know, science was my thing. I was like, Oh, I'm really interested in science. And I wanted to take like an AP advanced course because the other one, they go, no, they go, no proposition 48 Ruiz. If you fail, and you don't get the chance to play, we're going to kick your butt. So they, they discouraged they discouraged advanced learning for me. They wanted me down here where it was easy pick-ins, pass all your classes. And that's Texas football. That's the best way to describe Texas football was priority on Friday night. And, yeah, they, they gave you a GPA. So football was a class, and everybody got an A. So then it boosted everybody's GPA. Yep. I was just slumming it. Back in the Midwest, having to take all AP classes, earn my playing time like a normal kid, not getting that Ruiz treatment. No. <laughs> I can speak to the, the losing side of the program. Because we, I was in a city in which our rival won state championship every single year. So then the, there was a lot of pressure for the 150K head coach AD at our losing school to win. Or otherwise, three years, it was just a, 
the freaking yeah. rotation. Um, so then they would kind of force people to run track. It was not a motivation to get better or get faster or kind of learn how to sprint. It was, you're doing this because we have to. And, mm -hmm. and um, my guys, we started the lacrosse team and then we were check in every year. And as guys got into lacrosse or they were good at basketball or a different sport, coaches were saying, all right, this is, you, you can get hurt. So this is going to take away our opportunity to win, even though, you know, we were getting freaking manhandled every year. So then they say, if you play lacrosse, if you play basketball, you will not start for us at quarterback, running back, whatever these guys were, because it was all skilled positions. So it was, it was the opposite of a freaking culture. So it was a, just amazing experience to kind of live the other side of it and see the guys across the river or across the bayou, basically fucking it's the way life. And then, uh, you know, they're running track, willing to get better. Mm -hmm. Is that culture shifting now with all, you know, we've all the shit coming out with the CTE and the head trauma at a young age in these no. states? I mean, I know it is no. elsewhere. No, I mean, um, you know, like I, I've heard that stuff. Um, or is that just media fucking no, like? No, like I've, I've heard it pretty, pretty extensively. Um, <laughs> you know what? I, I, I got hit up on my old high school. Um, they uh, kind of ironically, they hired a, the freshman football coach is a comedian, and I um, do you remember the guy who was in wedding <laughs> crashers? You remember when uh, when they're at the wedding and the guy gets up there and he's like, he was there for me in my seventh time in rehab. Yeah, you know, right? like, fact, yeah, his best yeah, man. So, yeah, so the fat guy, uh, his best man. Um, he's the freshman football coach. I guess he's like a pretty well known comedian or something. So okay. he's the freshman football coach. And so I get this email from some dude that I played with, you know, like 20 years ago. It hits me on Facebook, like, hey, they're trying to bring some alumni back to talk to the players. And I get this email from this guy, and I like look at the name, and I'm like, I don't know who this dude is. And so I literally Google the guy, and it comes up, and I'm like, no. This <laughs> Fair enough. But, I mean, he liked, like they said they got a pretty good turnout. They had like 60, 70 kids coming out for freshman football. Nice. Uh, wasn't there a threat of the program folding? Yeah. Yeah, no, they were fucking going to shut it down. I mean, they, um, I think they actually uh, didn't finish the season because they had injuries and the parents were worried and the kids, you know, they had a bunch of kids playing both ways and they shut the season down. So I don't know, maybe they're trying to rebuild the culture, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I think um, football as we, we know it will change in a lot of places, but I don't think it'll ever change in Texas. In those places? Yeah. yeah I mean, because – as long as there's a, something like the NFL and there's teams like Texas, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, going and seeing Baylor and just some of those programs, um, you know, I mean, literally it's like, that's the altar. I mean, it just, you know, I, I don't see it really changing, but, uh, you know, and you can see the success spread across the colleges. It's yeah. not just one or two universities that are competitive. You got TC, you got Baylor, you got UT, yeah. you got A&M, uh, you got U of H. I, I mean, the list goes on, Sam Houston state, right, Raph? So Absolutely. I mean, all, you know, yeah, there's uh, a the, lot the, of alma room. Mater, the alma mater of Rafael Weiss and Benny Wiley. Benny Wiley, eat him up, cats. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Benny's on that show strong. He won it. He What? He won it. He won the whole thing. Oh, my God. Fixes in. The, Fix. He was the final guy. He won the whole freaking. Oh, I, I so saw, what is this show? I, I, okay, so Sylvester Stallone uh, created the show called like Stronger, mm -hmm. Strong or something, and they hired uh, uh, Gabby L. Reese was the spokesperson, and so that was like you know like when that show kind of launched. That's how I think Mackenzie and uh, Laird Hamilton launched their XPT Life deal. Uh, was based off of that kind of the heels of that, but they had this show, and it was uh, I think they they found celebrity trainers or people like Benny Wiley. And they paired them up with um, Fat House. Yeah, just a um, average, um, average female, uh, middle aged female, to, and and they work out together. Yeah, and then they, they train together, and then they have all these different uh, kind of Biggest Loser kind of battles. Do the coaches there. design the workouts? No, I, I think. Oh, no, the no, coaches. I, think, I, I believe that the coaches were allowed their kind of specialty because it was like a an MMA coach. There's yeah. you know Benny Wiley. There's you know Todd Durkin. There's all these guys that have different, and they were really good with the comprehensive mix between the two. So they, um, I, I don't know if it was complete autonomy, like, hey, turn it loose, but I think they allowed them to showcase what they do well. And then the competitions were just like, 
Oh, it, school it, courses? It, it was kind of like Biggest Loser stuff. Like, you know how they have those, like, pretty elaborate, com- uh, you know. Uh, I mean, you got to forgive you know, me. I don't watch any of this shit. Like, really? I've never, I've never watched Biggest Loser. Oh, I've never okay. watched any of this. Stuff. I love Biggest Loser because um, uh, the um, – so for somebody who, like me who's uh, emotionally disconnected from all these hits to the head, I have to sometimes – watch things to try to figure out some you know some emotion oh that is that an emotion yeah i'm like oh. i can do that i think yeah i was like yeah i'm, 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 I'm really. so, uh, so I, I, empathy. I i learned empathy by watching the biggest loser mm, interesting so but the uh the one thing i was really amazed by is um people like uh like they bring in these people that are you you know the premise of the show. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I know the So so they bring in these people like whole lives in, in, in spiral, they're really heavy, overweight, and they put they lock them in a the house, they put them with these trainers like you know, Bob Harper. Yeah. They people. train them up and then well, they just weigh they, against each other. They right? train them up, but they, they weigh them and they like monitor their food. I mean, the level of emotion, like you realize um, the people aren't heavy because they just made a bad mistake. They made it heavy because they're really emotionally broke yeah. for whatever reason and then they the way instead of drugs or alcohol they use food as an mm-hmm. addiction like kiwi for example and um the show is pretty interesting because uh uh they pretty much fucking starve these people mm-hmm. like when you're looking at how many calories you're feeding them i mean they're making them work out i mean it's it's straight up up to the burn where like they have a watch they know that hey i ate 300 calories today i gotta burn fucking 10,000. Right. and so it's it's straight up numbers game so but that that competition is like you step on a but, scale lowest weight wins or but, highest well, weight yeah, loses. But, but they have uh, every week they have a challenge okay. where if you win the challenge, then you're not free to go home. Or okay, so you so, get pre- yeah, you're yeah, protected. Yeah, yeah, you get a free pass. And so, uh, but like the challenges were always pretty like uh, you know, eventful. I mean, like crazy shit. Like we have this fucking erector set. So all physical challenge. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And like watching people like break down is pretty fucking epic, dude. Like seeing yeah. like <laughs> like running like an old course, like at the yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay, you have to go over this six story uh, net. But, but, but the one thing is, is uh, what I really liked about the show is that you see these people that like at the beginning can hardly do anything. And then all of a sudden they like kind of get into the mindset and they get competitive. And then they actually like surprise each other, like surprise them. And you're like, fuck, that person did that shit. Mm-hmm. So I think it's pretty empowering in that way. And um, I So then like, what are the competitions on Strong? Uh, just I th- like races, I obstacle courses? It's like the same type of stuff. Like, uh, you know, I mean, you know, Betty Wiley was sleeveless shirts. So I mean, it's fucking Rick is with us. Is that it? So, Ralph, was it like basically obstacle course stuff or like strongman competitions? What I mean, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. That's exactly it. And, and Tex, you know, Benny, it's uh, uh, nobody's ever going to outwork him. I mean, that guy's got an unbelievable motor, you know, couple that with, with God-given horsepower, and that guy will just crush you into oblivion. I mean, look at the size of his biceps. I mean, I think they, they actually highlighted that a number of times, like zoom in on the biceps. So the guy's the guy's gifted. Well, with big biceps. Yeah. The bicep is the uh, most important muscle. Of the body. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, like, is the of, is the spider in the web of athleticism? I believe. I don't believe so. <laughs> I don't believe that actually, the uh, it, it's the keystone. So the bicep is the keystone of athleticism. Uh huh. So. You know, I, I would agree. I, I it's believe kind of like the bicep that. is the keystone for getting buy-in from an athlete. Well, oh, Raph, you remember the story with Dion and uh, the coach with the big biceps? Absolutely. That was one of the things that, uh, you know, his very first thing, um, it was interesting where the doc, Dr. Gasser, was the one that did his eval. So the uh, very first day we brought him in and Dr. Gasser shows up and, you know, he's got his scrubs on and, and Gas and I have been working out forever and the guy's jacked and cut up. And that's the very first thing Dion's like, I don't care what you do with me, but I need arms like that. And that was his, his call to everything. I go, listen, everything that we did, he was like, Hey, what is this working? I'm like, biceps. What is this working? <laughs> biceps? <laughs> what does this do? Hey, I'm dying here. I'm like biceps. And it literally everything was based off of getting him to do something. And we used biceps as a motivation. Well, one of my proudest moments was playing against the Dallas Cowboys and jumping over the pile and knocking Dion. <laughs> I took a late hit on Deion Sanders and he fucking yelled at me for like fucking easily the rest of like eight, nine, ten plays. Yeah. I ain't trying to hit nobody out here. I ain't trying to hit nobody out here. What are you doing? Like screaming at me. Like he was so upset that I saw him. I was like, dude, I took a late shot on prime time. How many people said they got to like take a late shot? Uh, did you get fined for that? 
Uh, no, I don't think I did because um, that that was the good old days. Well, that was before they uh, tagged me with the history of violence. Uh-huh. So uh, <laughs> I went to the history of violence. That was probably <laughs> what caused the violence. So. Uh-huh. It's good stuff. What else we got, Tex? Uh, I got some questions just looking back in the League of Shadows book. Oh, boy. I think our listeners would benefit from. And first one's, I think it's a layup for you. So your approach to fixing athlete with more than one issue with the movement. And then I remember your goal that you, you mentioned was just gradual change. So you could talk about your approach for fixing more than one issue. Um, I always go for, um, it, it, technically, I'm going to start from the floor up. So if I watch somebody, if, if we're going to be technically oriented, and if I'm going to watch somebody do a squat, step up, or a lunge, um, I'll start at the feet. Um, I'll watch somebody's foot, how they hold their feet, because the foot will always tell me um, if something is tight. So um, today in the, in the gym when guys are doing front foot elevated lunges, um, the moment they start to bear weight on that front foot, it starts to roll or it starts to roll. I start, you know, I can figure out if they've got tight perineals or um, whatever the case may be. And so I'll start from the foot and then work myself up from there. Um, but it's always interesting where I, I have a tendency over the, uh, the course of my career where I was a, uh, I would crack the whip and yell and scream. Um, but then I started to, to understand that, you know, to win the war, um, you had to let a little bit of slop go um, with the idea that, especially with millennials, where the moment I start yelling at somebody, they're going to they're gonna break down and cry. Um, so I had to soften my approach and, and, and almost to the point where, let me just get you to lunge. Let me just get you to do something. Um, and then as I develop that habit, as I develop that trust, then I can start chipping away at the, the, the fine tuning. But from a yeah, technical a aspect... Roth, a little piece of me just died. <laughs> I mean, like, like, like. The, we can edit that out. That's fine. I know. I, I mean, like, listen to this. Like, like a little piece of me just died. Like, the well, fact, it's balancing. It's balancing the psychology of athletes, right? Well, like, I mean, like you, you know, like this is something too, and uh, I'm sure you know, having a kid is put is given Roth perspective as well, because I know, like, um, if I'm the fucking dick all the time, it we don't get anywhere, and mm-hmm. like you almost have to like, and I don't know, maybe maybe with Raider that works, but like. Fucking girls will straight shut down on you. Yeah, I'm hoping my son isn't like that. I'll fucking burn him at the stake. But um, no, I mean that's kind of a sad realization. Where now you have a situation where because uh, uh, training with Rafa is anything but kind and gentle. So to actually hear that, I, I, I wish I got to know that Rafa Ruiz. <laughs> I don't even. Tex, did you know that Ruiz? Negative. Negative. Did he try to drown only, you? So only in lessons. So if we were any in a seated kind of safe place, then. The, uh, the teacher would come out and he'd explain this, but then anytime the freaking we were on our feet or moving or doing anything, I, I got to experience a, a small fraction of what, what you experienced during your time. Yeah, that was good though. Oh yeah, it was but, way but, too much. But the best part is, is uh, as the, the training increased, I got to be the instigator for most of it. Well, as new people would come. Oh yeah, we used to fuck with the new people bad. Rob, Rob would be like, hey, uh, you should train with John today. <laughs> and, and talking with John, and uh, he's saying all the new guys would have to train with him. I remember you just putting me with all these 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 tough cases, like like uh, like Tarver or anybody. I'd be the guy that had to go train with them. So I don't know if it was like me being a stickler coach to them. That's what I thought at the time. But now I realize just talking to John is just trying to freaking burn me. And uh, <laughs> Well, you, you know, hey, he's trying to little show trial by fire. I mean, would you have wanted it any other way? No, not at all, of course. Because I thought, oh, I'm a good coach. That's what he's putting with these guys. <laughs> but it's just like, hey, these are tough athletes. I'm going to well, burn this kid. Well, well, there's a difference between being a tough athlete and dealing with Antonio Tarver. Cool. True. Yeah, I mean, that's more like, um, uh, what's the right word for that? I think you have to you have to know what buttons to push. Yeah, yeah, that's a very finicky athlete, and you have to know. Um, and one button might work in one situation, and you try it again, and and, and it completely bombs on you. So, um, understanding the fine finer points of coaching and being able to play within that ebb and flow is really um, the greatest thing that I ever learned. You know, working with Tarver is, you know, there's times when, you know, I really needed him to do well, and all I had to do was get the camera out. You know, it's all of a sudden as I would grab my camera and be like, 
all right, Tarver, here we go. I'm going to record this one, and boom. You know, we could have had 10 crappy reps, 10 crappy sets, and the moment that that thing turns on, he's like, boom, Hollywood, showtime, and he does really good reps because, it, you know, whether he thinks it's going to be immortalized, whether he's just camera friendly, but that's that was one of his things. Well, I, I always found it interesting with, um, with coaching is and like like this this is something that's kind of blown my mind and uh i'm sure you know you guys can relate and maybe not relate but the idea of wanting it more than what your athlete wants like i remember that was really hard for me especially running in a commercial gym wanting them to do better than what they wanted for themselves and like i realized that was kind of hard i'm like dude i want this more than you do and they're like yeah i don't really want this i'm like then why the fuck are you here and um, that to me is like kind of when you transition between like, you know, working with like the, you know, let's say the everyday type person. But, you know, I mean, we trained with, you know, uh, our good friend Bill Soltzing, who had no reason to be there, um, you know, and, uh, you know, trained his ass off and busted his ass and literally like was a stickler on everything. So, I mean, like, you know, and then you get into a situation where you get kids all the time. I mean, especially you're working, you know, uh, you know we work with athletes and, you know, this one you're paying me two you're here why wouldn't you put a hundred percent and maximize everything available to you like, like why slot the rep it's kind of like um the um years ago uh, when i owned a crossfit gym uh i used to count people's reps all the time like it was my favorite thing to do like i know this sounds weird but like it's a 21 15 9 and i would always count people's reps and i only met two people that actually consistently always did more reps and it was the funniest thing to me. I'm like, for the most part, most of the people were always like a rep, of like a rep or two off. And you know, a lot of people were pretty even, but always two people. And I once asked them and uh, I was like, why, you know, you guys always end up doing more. And the one guy told me, he's like, well, yeah, it's like a uh, uh, freebies. I'm here to work out, you know, and you want me to do 45 reps. If I get 48, then technically I'm stealing from you. Hmm. And, uh, and then the other person told me that she uh, was a terrible counter and she would forget where she was. And if she forgot where she was, she would just start over. And one of those is Josh Bonwell, mm -hmm. who is uh, one of our, by far one of our best CrossFitters and uh, dude made amazing games. And the other one was my wife. I was like, all right, I appreciate that. And I was like, you just don't randomly pick a number. She's like, no, I started zero again. And I was like, that's a good level of honesty. That was, uh, that was good enough for me. I was like, let's get married. That's so that was it. That's what <laughs> it was it. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, um, yeah. Among other things. Well, well, no, but like, I mean, that, that type of stuff. But what was amazing was the people that consistently cut reps and the people that consistently lied uh, had never made any progress. Like mm -hmm. there was one person we had named Maddie Lyles and Maddie was like the queen of like, you know, let's the say- rep cutter. Oh, it was unreal. You, 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 was she there when you were there? Just at the tail end. Oh my God, it was unreal. Like, like it'd be like, let's say 2059, she'd do like nine, four, one, and then scream dump. I'd be like, okay. <laughs> And like it, it, she was in terrible shape and I'm like, come on, dude, like, like, are we kidding? So, but, uh, you know, with athletes, you run into that same thing too. You're like, dude, you, what you're doing. But I, I also think too, a lot of coaches have a tough time, um, creating the bridge between what they're doing in the weight room and the performance on the field or performance in the pool or whatnot. And I think Rob does a great job of not only, uh, uh showing the transition. So then like all of a sudden the, the person has this epiphany moment, like, Oh, if I do this better, I do better out here. And you're like, yeah. What do you think? We're just here to fucking waste time. <laughs> so, oh, absolutely. And I think the, from a professional standpoint, I think the biggest gains that I started to make is when I started to close the books, and I started to go out to the coaches. I I, I would just shut my mouth, bring a clipboard out, and I would sit there and say, um, you know, sitting out there with the bucks, and I would just listen to what Lovey Smith was asking his players to do. What. Um, Herm Edwards was asking his players to do and I wouldn't ask any questions I would just sit there and say okay he wants their stance like this he wants them to be able to read this and break on this and I would watch the athletes whether they could do it or whether they couldn't do it who did it efficiently who didn't do it efficiently and for me I started to pair all of that up and it, it gave me immediate buy-in with the athletes because all of a sudden it wasn't a hey let's squat more it was hey if you fix this you could get a better break on the ball like in the drill you did today. And the guys were like, boom, it just makes sense. Or um, you could hit a home run where, 
be like, hey, um, you're not getting a great break on the ball because you're weak on this muscle. And the guys, you know, like I said, a home run, they could be like, oh, you know, that's every time in the beginning of two days, I'm really always sore right there. And you're like, there it is. And next thing you know, you've built that great relationship with the athlete. So literally getting, closing the books and saying, what are the coaches asking these athletes to do was, was a huge game changer for me. And then moving into the pool, it, it, it becomes so natural because the, there isn't any other sport that you perform by feel. Um, it's the one thing that is completely um, not say that it doesn't happen in other sports, but it is head and shoulders. If you don't have good feel for the water, you are not going to be a high level swimmer. You just won't do it. I mean, that's what it becomes a differentiator between the two. Like Tex, Tex had great feel for the water. That's why. <laughs> well, yeah, like, he's so hairy. He had those, uh, those feel for the ground. Oh. Feel for my feet. <laughs> well, I was going to say, Tex, you know, you're not really what I would call uh, long and lean. No, no, no. I'm, I'm the 96th percentile for bone density in the world, John. I'm yeah. A sinker. So you're, you're a brick yeah, with, a good with short limbs. Yeah. I'm hard to move. <laughs> yeah. And inflexible. Define flexibility. Uh, <laughs> and next subject. Uh, level 99 supple leopard. You have to be able to blow yourself. I'm out. <laughs> hey, Will Farrell. I did it. I never have to leave my own house. Uh, all right. So next question, and I guess it's related. Uh, how do you test if your coaching is effective? For me, if I, I try to periodically – um, as I build up certain things within a workout as well as within a week's worth of workout and then within that macro cycle, um, I will schedule times where I don't coach. I literally will walk away and I will see um, because it's one of the things that I've always, um, and it comes back to our previous conversation where I was, I would crack the whip and make sure your foot is this way, make sure your knee is this way, make sure your foot is this way, make sure your knee is this way. And then, you know, come to the realization like, hey, this kid's got to go out there and do it on his own. Um, and so I wanted to see if, if my voice was sticking in his head. Um, and, and I always use that as a good indicator. Um, if I put that coaching cue in the beginning of the workout, prime it through some good warm up stuff. And then all of a sudden, when I watch him into that second, third or fourth cycle, how are they doing with it? Um, and then I would do the same thing uh, basically on our week schedule. If I'm building up into something, that fun Friday is basically a challenge to everything that we did um, the, through the, the three or four days beforehand, and, and I don't want to coach that one. That's the hoorah-rah one, and I want to see um, under duress, are you still adhering to the things that I tried to teach you on a Monday and a Tuesday kind of issue? And that's how I know things are working or they're not working. I'm like, okay, I'm not getting to Jill. I'm not getting to Michael or so-and-so is responding really, really well to certain coaching cues. Yeah, this is a, a conversation or argument, whatever you want to call it, I have with Callie. And she's coming from a military background, and she said in, in coaching warm-ups or uh, any formal coaching, you want to give step-by-step, -step and you're directing them through this. And I said, well, no, we want to put them in a position to, like you always say, solve a problem with their bodies. So if it's just, uh, say, Spider-Man, for example, if we do Spider-Man right side and we're leading kind of step-by-step -step process, and you're like, all right, left, and then see if they were kind of paying attention or they're relying on you. So this is something we talked back and forth about. I don't know if it ever got to her, but uh, that's one of the most valuable lessons is, is just kind of uh, set them free and see if what you're actually doing is going to be effective because you're not going to be there behind them on the court or the field or in the pool. I'm, I am a huge proponent of that. Um, come up with a new drill, come up with a new exercise. Um, and oftentimes, and we talk about coaching in this new generation, um, everything is such a, you take half of the athletes in there, whether they're auditory or visual learners. Um, I tell my athletes that are visual learners, you're not going to watch anybody. I'm going to give you instructions. I want you to follow those instructions and watch them completely melt. But the idea is start to learn how to do that. Um, that's one of my coaching cues or one of my coaching techniques is I'm going to say, explain a Spider-Man and be like, Hey, I don't understand. Just listen to my voice and start to do what I'm telling you to do. And they just take a big deep breath, calm down and try to do it. Um, oftentimes we get so stuck in metrics. Um, I'm a firm proponent of five, 10, five, make it a, make it a seven, make it a seven, three, four drill. 
where you kind of kick the cone out, kind of move it off to this angle, because in the end, once they get on the field, a change of direction is a change of direction, and where guys all of a sudden get used to that. Um, guys get really good at doing a drill and, and bettering their metrics, and they do that little hop change of direction where they're running, and then they just kind of hop and change. You know, you move that cone out an extra two yards, and they're like, whoa, whoa where's my cone? Or they don't know how to hop into it. Um, and that kind of gives you a little bit of self-efficacy of, of is your program working because they are, no matter the distance of that, they are still changing directions really, really well. Posture and position. Uh, I don't know how science y'all you, you, want to go, but uh, I'm interested in kind of relearning feed forward and feedback loops and any kind of paraphrase or example you can give to our listeners because I know they have little to no experience with this and I'm sure they'd love to learn. So you talked about uh, using change of direction as a great example and then mixing up the cones. Absolutely. So um, basically there's this constant interplay and, and we as coaches oftentimes forget there's this constant interplay between um, if we break it down to a basic squat, as you're doing your basic squat, you do it one time um, and you do it again, you do it again and, and you start to plug that into habitual memory, into an autonomic memory every squat that you do your body is always constantly evaluating and reevaluating compared to what you have positively or negatively reinforces what you want to do and so every set that you do um, subconsciously your body is saying this doesn't feel right it has to change something it has to move something it has to do something to try to replicate what we have ingrained in those athletes um, and then it has to try to make those minor adjustments to replicate that um, sometimes it happens at such high velocity that they can't do it sometimes they don't have an opportunity to do it that's why we always strive for develop posture develop positioning and we want to challenge posture and positioning um, in as many different modes as you possibly can so i want a wide squat i want a narrow squat i want a staggered squat i want an iso elevated squat because the bottom line is I'm trying to see if you can keep your hips just like this. Doesn't matter if one foot is elevated, can you keep your hips level? Um, and basically we always forget that when you're talking about high speed movements, your spinal cord is part of your brain. Um, and most people forget that they think, Hey, what, what's going on in here? But that feed forward loop is basically happening below the brain stem. It's something that you don't sit there and say, oh, wait, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel correct in the position it's supposed to. That efferent and afferent copy is happening at the spinal cord level. So most people need to readjust our thinking of saying your brain is basically from here all the way to your tailbone. Um, and that loop is what your body is going to use at higher velocities. Would it... Uh if that's the case with some form of, I don't know, maybe like a T-spine, some form of like spine injury, whether it be like a herniated disc or something, affect your ability to process information? Huge. Any type of inflammation, any type of bulging disc, anything like that, basically um, that constant feedback and feed loop will come back to what Tex is talking about with inflexibilities. Um, anytime that something, uh, geometric variability will dictate if something moves slightly and it doesn't have to be much. All it has to do is just slightly move from where it was, and it changes your perception and consequently drives a change into your proprioception of how that movement is supposed to feel. So even though you don't think that not stretching is going to bother you, but one little motion, 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 and all of a sudden your shoulders roll forward, it changes completely how the original movement is supposed to feel. And it changes everything from your muscle spindles, it changes everything from your Golgi tendon organs. Um, all of those working together are basically feed forward and feedback looping to try to emulate what you think it's supposed to be. Do you believe that there's some form of perfect picture in our mind of what it should look like and then based off of that perfect picture or do you think that most people really never even get to that point where they have a picture of what it should look like? Oh, I believe that the, the picture is your current and we say it all the time is this is your new baseline. So yeah. come back to new to this new baseline. So if I make an adjustment on an athlete and I'm like, okay, here's a here's a stretch that you did, and all of a sudden on a staggered squat, their heel is down. Boom! There's your new baseline. 
that's your new perfect. So protect that. But tomorrow we may fix something else and then that becomes your new perfect. So um, it gets the athletes away from the idea that they're always going to be constantly comparing. You know, as I look over, I'm like, God, I don't squat as much as John and I don't squat as much as Luke and I don't squat as much as Tex. It's okay. I'm a little bit better than when I walked in these doors. So yeah. Cool idea. You know, we, we had a uh, pretty interesting deal. We, we had to teach uh, 50 plus people how to squat uh, that are not English speakers in Ooh. a relatively short amount of time. And the problem is, is, uh, you know, when you start talking about, you know, the toes forward model that we use, uh, they are, you know, like, it's so fucked up. I mean, like, like we, we got into it and just started talking about, you know, landmarks and obviously the knees are supposed to track on the insteps. And, you know, the problem is, is that if, uh, you know, you squat super narrow, but yet, you know, everybody's driving their knees outside the toe box, you're getting all these people rolling up and lifting up their big toe and just being able to like fix a lot of these things. Like, I just want you to keep your big toe down. I mean, just really, yeah. really basic things like, um, you know, as you squat, all of a sudden you're in a toes forward and now all of a sudden you squat and you're in this position, just inching your heels out to find a more natural position. Mm -hmm. And even teaching it, and, you know, we went with it with, uh, you know, Tex did a great job in terms of the deep meaning of understanding, like, here's a universal athletic position. This is what it looks to go. You know, why are you squatting in, in terms of replicating this and kind of getting into different movements? And uh, it's almost as if um, it seemed, I mean, and maybe because we've said it so many times or we've seen the practical application, but literally talking to people about this is like things that they've never heard. Well, and... Uh, yeah, I, what I'm seeing uh, consistently now over the past six months is, I don't know if they've always been saying it, but now it's just popping in, in my head. Every seminar, somebody says, this doesn't feel right. Yeah, it and feels they, different. They, it feels different. They immediately shut down, and I, I recall the note that you, you gave me during this lecture was the subconscious inflexible and instabilities. They are already quitting based off but, uh, their old squat. But don't you think like um, – uh, there's such a weird deal, and I always think like, and, and the, the only person I can use is, you know, like, you know, to quote our, you know, our mentor, Greg Glassman, uh, we fail at the, at the margins of our experience. Uh, for me personally, and Roth will tell you this, like, I was like, I don't give a fuck. Just tell me how to be the best. Well, great. This is what we're going to do. And I, I would always ask, like, hey, can you explain to me, like, why are we doing it? I wasn't trying to be uh, combative. I just was fucking curious. Um, you know, like, you know, and Rob's always good. Like, hey, we're doing it because of this, this, and this. I'm like, well, I was going to do it anyway, but I appreciate the, <laughs> the dialogue for it. But we run into a lot of people that, um, well, this isn't how I was doing it. Yeah. And I'm like, and my, my favorite is, why do you assume that you were doing it correctly? I ran so, into a guy at a seminar. Uh, I'm like, all right, we're working up to a 3RM. We're going heavy today. He's like, I, I don't squat like this. I'm not going heavy. That's dangerous. I'm like, well, what's heavy? Give me a number of what you think is heavy. He's like, I squat 500 pounds. I go, do you do it this way? He's like, no. I'm like, then find what's heavy this way because we want to find your breaking point because everybody looks good under a light barbell. Yeah. We're going to see what, why you're doing what you're doing and see if we can't make you better. Yeah, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, if it gets heavy enough, uh, eventually we'll see things start to break down at which point like we can correct certain things. And, and what's amazing is how many people actually like will – give you lift service when it's light and do what you want. And then the minute that all of a sudden the weight gets to a point serious, instantly they go back to their default. Yep. And I'm being like, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why are you defaulting back to this? And it's, uh, um, you know, like. Well, the, this loop right here? Well, no, well, it, it is, but it's also this, uh, this weird antagonist of ego and, um, you know, I always called it like pride and, uh, um, what is it? Uh, pride and ego, but I think somebody else that we had a better one than pride. It was uh, shit. What were we talking about? Um, fuck, it'll come to me in a second. But uh, that that idea of like, all right, I paid money. You know, you guys are the best. I believe in you, obviously enough to come to your seminar. Now, why all of a sudden is it about? No, I'm you know, not yeah, I'm not doing it. Or more importantly, well, this is what I did. And I, I always ask people, I'm like, why did you assume that you were doing it correctly? Who, you, you know, like, what would have led you to believe this? Well, it just feels right. Well, uh, people, things feel right because you've done them, and this is the most amount of movement patterns. But let me tell you how many people, you know, are willing to come and change. I mean, we, we had a, a guy in Austin, Texas years ago when we taught at CrossFit Central. The guy literally came to the seminar, and I was like, you know, we go around expectations while you're here. And the guy's like, I, I came to learn how to squat. And I was like, what's wrong with squat? He's like, I have a excruciating knee pain to the point where it hinders everything in my life. And I've seen all these different coaches – and uh, somebody told me that you could help me with this knee pain. And I was like, all right, fucking, that's easy. 
let me see you squat. So I watched him squat and I was like, now let's squat the way I want you to. And, and the problem was the guy was so literally shoving his, his, his hips so far forward and his knees went so far over his toes. I literally like stood behind him and basically just pulled him back into me and was like pulling his hips. I'm like, I just want you to sit to the point where like his knee ran parallel with his big toe. Mm -hmm. And like instantly the dude comes out of it and he's like, it's the first time my knees haven't hurt. I explained to him about tibial torsion and you know what you were doing and the whole deal. And uh, I see the dude like two years later at the CrossFit Games. He like, walks over to me and I'm like, how those knees feeling? He's like, no more knee pain. He's like, from day forward, I never had knee pain again. Mm -hmm. Crazy. It was by far the best invest of my life. And, uh, you know, night and day. And I remember thinking to myself, here was somebody who was like, and Roth, and I, I always joke with text with this one, it's like when the mass is ready, the student appears. I mean, this dude was ready for a change and he needed it and came to us and we were able to give him that change. And I wish everybody could be that open-minded. But unfortunately, you have to either be searching for something or, or you know, like... Correct. You have to be, like, if you're at the top of your game, you're not searching for something. Mm -hmm. So... But I think one of the issues that we run into is is the culture and the metrics of uh, the culture of metrics where uh, we are at the highest point where we are evaluated by how much you squat, how much you bench, how much you um, yada, 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 which and, and this is what I've learned, you know, teaching CrossFit football over all those years is we, we can't win that fight um, if if we're going to stand at the mountaintop and say, Hey, you know, we squat more than you. Well, we can't come back and be the ones that say, Hey, but we, we should adjust our squat. Um, the idea is as, as power athlete changing the culture of saying, listen, um, we really need to expound upon, you know, vertical jumping. So yes, we're going to get you to squat better, but like you guys do a great job of, can we jump better? And how does that relate to your squat? Um, getting metrics like injury prevention. You know, nobody ever says, hey, you know, injury prevention, blah, blah, blah. I've never torn an ACL or, you know, reducing the severity of injuries. Uh, it was interesting when I was at the University of Tampa, um, we, we, we did a very extensive ACL program. Um, and in the beginning of my career, uh, the, the athletic trainers were going crazy because we were getting a lot of hamstring strains. And um, I remember sitting there and I didn't have an answer for it. I was like, crap, you know, um, we, we reduce the, you know, the probability of an ACL, but you know, what good is it with all of these hamstring um, tears and strains? Um, and that's where I started to change the way that I looked at that of saying, listen, you know, the hamstring, um, we, we need to put force production of the hamstring um, on, on the secondary, on, on the back burner, because first and foremost, I need to treat the hamstring as a dampening spring it needs to receive an unbelievable amount of force of a soccer player running full speed and planning and changing directions on a dime. Um, and then once I started to change my thinking and, and melting into that, um, it's, it allowed me to, to change some exercise, um, to do a lot more heavy squat. I mean, heavy, uh, lunging, heavy step ups, um, that allowed that athlete to basically treat and, and changing that culture of saying, listen, dampening spring, dampening spring, dampening spring, um, and it really helped out a lot in terms of the way that, that, that we started developing athletes. Well, so I had this actually on my list of questions to ask, and I was going to ask you to, to go into that story. And then what we, what we talked about were the load shares and how you went from ACL injury, and then you picked up on the hamstrings and then uh, to butts and lower back. Could you kind of talk about that? Well, his biggest load share was butthurt. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, oh. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> could, you, could you talk about the the time frame in terms of uh, actualization and thought process that got you to that that point of load sharing on the posterior chain? Well, basically, um, at the University of Tampa or any scholastic um, any scholastic institution, they do a really good job. Um, anybody that has a athletic training department, they do a great job with the statistics of injuries, um, and so. Uh, Scott Brickett, our athletic, uh, our, our athletic trainer over there, was great because we would sit and talk and say, how's the development going? Um, these are the injuries that we're seeing. And so basically, we played a game of cat and mouse um, you know, for 10 years at the university of saying, okay, let's, let's chase the elephant in the room, and that's let's reduce some ACLs. Um, we worked on that program. We got the hamstring stronger, and next thing you know, the new elephant in the room became you know, hamstring strains and tears. 
And so we had to sit there and try to figure that out. And then once we got that dampening spring more efficient, and then all of a sudden it started to go into lower legs. So it started going to perineals and it started going into calf strains. So then we started to do a bunch of work with that. And then eventually we got down into the feet. So, um, and it's no different than any strain conditioning coach that tries to rehab an athlete and you'll find, um, somebody fresh off of an ACL. It's like, okay. Um, most people forget that, that ACL, once the doctor's done with that, you give it a couple weeks and that thing is solid as a rock. And, and there, once you pass that grace period, there isn't much of an opportunity for the athlete to, to re-tear that. Most athletes don't re-tear, um, a surgically repaired ACL like, uh, Roy Birch, um, the swimmer from Bermuda, he had a, um, we had to get over this huge hurdle. He was the one that, um, very gifted athlete, really tight quads and hip flexors, went up for a dunk and, um, and ruptured both patella tens at the same time. So he had an avulsion fracture. Both of those um, popped that clean off. Um, once they, once they tacked those things back down through surgery, they did surgery literally the, a couple days after that. Um, and then I moved to Charlotte. We started his rehab to get him ready. Um, we got to the point where, uh, you know, three months out between the three and six month period where the bone graft is stuck in there and it is solid as a rock. Um, and, but it was painful, uh, clearly a very, very painful process for him. Um, and after uh, talking with the doctor, talking with our athletic training staff, um, I had to convince him, I'm like, you're not going to re-injure that. If you are going to get re-injured, it's going to be somewhere else. It might be up at the origin of your hip flexor. It might be into the lower leg, but you're not going to re-injure those patella tendons. It's going to hurt like all get out. It's going to be very painful, 11 on a 10, um, but they're not going to get re-injured. So you need to start pushing yourself. And that was the hard part for him was you know, getting him to do small hops, getting him to do small jumps, because if we couldn't do that, we couldn't get him to dive off the blocks. And that became a constant battle. I'm like, listen, you know, you're going to have to suck it up. You're just going to have to suck it the fuck up and just go. And it, it just took him a while to understand that. And he's like, and, and every day I'm, he would look me in the eye. Am I not going to injure myself? No, you're not going to re-injure that. No, you're not going to re-injure it. And then one day doing pull-ups, he just jumps up there you know, does his pull-ups, and then he's looking at me. I'm like, brother, let go, and he lets go, and he lands, and he's like, and from that point on, we could start getting aggressive into some uh, re-educating his hamstrings. That's good. I mean, um, you know, the, uh, the the one thing that I think is extremely valuable and was really kind of beneficial for our cross the football stuff is we got a chance to see so many diverse athletes from different geographical regions, different ethnicities, different places, uh, different backgrounds, all doing a universal training style and all being deficient in the same places. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I remember, you know, numerous conversations being like, wait a minute, like, like how can people be this deficient in so many ways? I mean, I, I remember uh, one of our first seminars, I mean, teach, you know, Ralph and I get out there and we're, we're doing the, just the change of direction demo and watching people change direction to the point where we did not feel comfortable adding any intensity. Like we'll do these with walkthroughs. And I remember, you know, early on we were kind of like, well, fuck it. If they're going to hurt themselves. They're going to hurt themselves. I mean, just, you know, even basic doing banded resisted runs, Oh you, man! Which we have eventually had to cut out yeah. of the program. Yeah, and, and we've we've had seminars where after we've cut the banded sprints out, where it's just supposed to be sprinting, and we're not. We're like, oh, we'll just do some flyaway starts, and that's or about we'll it. Or we'll do like, some 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 single leg bounding. I mean, you know, we had a uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, like you know, or how many people here do the style of training? How many people run gym? Oh, okay, awesome, you're in. And then I'm like, well, you just did a uh, ten yard resisted run. You were time under tension, less than. 15 seconds and you're rushing a calf mm -hmm. yeah. like, uh, or, you know, or the, uh, the amount of people always asking like, Hey, let's get a, you know, an injury breakdown. How many people are dealing with this? I mean, I remember talking to one guy actually this weekend, uh, who was giving me his injury history and I'm like, how old are you? Oh, I'm like, I was like, what, uh, what do you do for a living? And, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, corporate. I'm like, why do you have a, a fucking slap tear? A, uh, uh, a torn hamstring, a uh, fucking strained hip flexor. I mean, the amount of fucking injuries these guys were laying out. And I'm like, be smart about this. You have more injuries than a pro football player that's like doing this job. Like, what are you doing either, what are you doing or what are you not doing? Or more importantly, how are you biasing this thing that's letting this go down the road? And it's um, not even something that's on their radar. Like, what do you mean? 
And I'm like, well, everybody in the gym is injured. I'm like, no. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, so it, it, it's, it's been really interesting evolution to see where we started. And then, you know, Rob and I have talked about this for years is, uh, you know, being able to put some offerings together through Power Athlete that really address these type of things. Like, you know, like we've always talked about is being able to come in um, now that Rob's in uh, one place and doing some, uh, some stuff for a sprint seminar. Because uh, what we're really seeing is uh, a deficiency in people's understanding of sprint mechanics. And just merely picking your foot off the ground and hoping gravity is going to push you there is a fucking disservice to a lot of people. But gravity is like the strongest force on the planet, isn't it? Well, in the uh, universe. In the universe. <laughs> um, hey, I'm, I'm going to go with Usain Bolt. If it's a punch and hammer, toe up, knee up, put your foot <laughs> on the ground and drive. God, that's the most epic fucking exchange off of comments. Oh, uh, on the... <laughs> you remember, well, you remember so, that shit? So we, uh, um, we skin talked me Johnny into a book. I don't know if you saw, it's like a thousand pages. Uh-huh. And in it, we included all the comments. Yes, <laughs> in there, and then there's like John's pick to click, or like, is like the opening kind of chapter of yeah. why. And uh, that is like the article's really not that interesting, but make sure you take time for the comments. <laughs> well, yeah, when we were in there battling, and uh, it, it was pretty good. I mean, um, you know, like the, the illusion of crazy people uh, you mm-hmm. know, uh, never ceases to amaze me, but especially like um, being, a, I mean, like it's pretty apparent. Like if you watch high level sprinting, I mean, I'm talking like legitimate, like we just watched, I mean, just not only seeing the hamstring and like the, it was actually hilarious when we saw the girls getting ready to get in the blocks and doing all their run stuff. And I was like, man, these girls are pretty, pretty jacked. They kind of look like the CrossFit girls in Texas. Like, no, they got hamstrings. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. (laughs) You know, we always joked about is just that lack of hamstring development because, uh, you know, like, but you're funny. And their, their arm swing. And that's what, uh, whenever oh, they slow down the sprint. I, I can't even, I can't even get into that, that the, uh, the arm swing is a natural byproduct of just motion and that these are just pivots and these things swinging off. You don't worry about them. They just kind of float. Mm-hmm. Well, I, 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 it, it gave me a sense of hope just watching those girls run. Well, how, how aggressively exactly. punch and hammer, like, like these girls, like, like my, my favorite was on the, on the four by 100 when the girls would reach and they would get the uh, baton and they would bring the baton up and hit themselves in the face every time with it and almost use that to swing back. Yeah. Like the one girl cracked herself in the face and had like a mark on her head from hitting herself with the baton. Just and game. I'm like, well, punch and hammer. Yeah, yeah so literally, because they got the baton. Yeah, <laughs> literally got the baton. But uh, Ralph, we were at a we were at a convention or whatever, and we heard a lot a live clinic on on running and speed and sprinting, and the speaker was like, "You don't have to worry about your arms; they're just going to automatically do what they have to do." He's like, "I wouldn't be if I if the arms mattered. How can I do this?" And he put it. They put their arms at their side and then ran across the floor without swinging them, and that was his proof of concept. <laughs> Or the other one we saw recently was where they uh, uh, two people with a jump stretch band against them running in place, so that they could mimic leaning. Oh, I didn't do that. Oh, no, no, this was text, and I saw it, and I felt like I almost got AIDS watching. It. Like, <laughs> like gonna, you want to go get that checked out? Yeah, right? I, I was like, I, I gotta go see a doctor. But like, that's kind of where we. Uh, yeah, it's really bad, and um, you know, like something like I mean, for a long time we we, we need to roll this out, and hopefully. Uh, you know, rust power of the people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just, just being able to, uh, not only be able to sit down with people in a setting be like, all right, let's just talk about some basic mechanics here. This is the things I want you to work for check and then be able to get people out and actually be like, let me show you just, you know, a skips, B skips, just some of the technique stuff, toe up, you know, straight kicks, just a little bit of the sprint type demo and then teach people just how to fucking get out and roll out like that feeling of actually, you know, extending and being able to get a good arm swing and really bring that to life and, and put them in a track situation. Um, uh, I think that not only would that be uh, extremely exciting for us, but like that would fill such a fucking void. Like, God damn it. People just don't want to fucking run. Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, within within our profession, uh, one thing that's always been driven me is um, as a motivator in terms of what I do is uh, people don't know what they don't know. And for me, I've always found it um, my job is to 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 expose them to something that they don't know, um, whether it's, um, you know, on for face value, educating them on something. But really, it's, hey, do you realize that at the bottom of a lunge, you're leaning left? No, I don't. Well, 
that could lead to these three things. And next thing you know, what they didn't know now becomes very apparent, then they can fix it. And, and it's, it's always been our job is to not only let them know what they don't know, but also, you know, why it's relevant to them. They're like, Hey, you know, um, um, you, you have a 26 inch vertical, but your position standard is 30. But like, Hey, you know, basically you're doing a single leg jump, you know, with a little bit of spot of your right leg, you know, you start to even that out and push evenly through both legs. And next thing you know, that 30 becomes a pretty interesting, um, pretty attainable goal for you. Well, I mean, but uh, that's also assuming somebody is ready for that type of criticism. I mean, that's something that we oh, run into all, all the deal. Like, you know, just like trying to, you know, like like um, once I had a guy all of a sudden balance up, all of a sudden he's having all these problems. I'm like, um, well, what, 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 oh, like my hip feels like it's binding up. And I'm like, well, basically what you've been doing by your rotation and doing these other things. I mean, watching people set up and one foot's like two inches behind the other one and they don't even realize that they're squatting with their feet stacked. I had a guy there, I had to literally, uh, uh, um, you know, put like a, a piece of tape on the ground and be like, this is straight line. The guy's like, oh my God, that feels so uncomfortable. I'm like, that's your feet square. I'm like, you know, if you think you're doing a bilateral hip hinge and one foot's two inches behind the other, I'm like, you know, then you kind of go through yeah, the idea. Unintentionally, one, right? Yeah, unintentionally, because they just squatted to that pattern. And, you know, then you think about how many people actually have the ability to see these things. And then make a, a, a concerted effort to actually coach and improve. I mean, and that's something we run into all the time. And I think like we talked about earlier, um, the idea of wanting it more than your athlete wants it. Mm -hmm. And I think like as a coach, that part, at least for me, was what was by far the most difficult thing where I was like, if, uh, why do I want this more than you? And they were like, well, it's not really that important. I'm like, well, it's fucking not that important to me either. I'm fucking out of here. <laughs> you know? And I think, like, that's the hard part. So, I mean, like, I, I, I think Rob's in a phenomenal situation where you're in a situation where, you know, here are these young kids. You can bring them in. You can start building a culture. And, you know, all of a sudden these 9, 10-year-old kids, by the time they're 18 years old, are going to be so far ahead of the so far ahead of the game. I'm so excited. I, I, every day I go in there and I'm like, good God, you know, these 12-year-old kids. You know, because it, it's something that – was a big dream. We always talked about this, John. God, I wish I would have did this when I was younger. And I'm like, holy good God, I've got a 12 year old that is a gifted athlete who has great potential and you're doing the, you know, what I feel is, is the right stuff. And I'm like, I get excited for these kids. I'm like, holy shit, you know, and I can't wait to see what happens in the next 10 years for these guys. Yeah, no, I, I was in the pool yesterday with my kids and uh, with my daughters and um, I have uh, a little game I call drown proofing where uh, I let them swim around and I swim under the water and I pull them onto the bottom by their, you know, like grab by the foot and yank them to the ground and I hold them there until they fight their way up and then I let them up and they just kind of swim around and playing and then periodically I just pull them down. And uh, I got out and we played and uh, my wife was like, you know, like when I came inside, she's like, are you watching the kids? And I was like, they're okay. She's like, what do you mean? She's like, we well, have to watch them. I'm like, let me play. We just played drown proof. Yeah, I tried to drown them. They were still alive. Yeah, I was, like, <laughs> I was like, I tried to drown them. And like to the point where like I pick them up and I throw them across the pool and then they have to keep swimming. And like, it's going to be pretty funny because they're four. They're going to be like, oh yeah, my dad's been trying to drown me for years. <laughs> but I mean, even, even the baby at like three months, uh, you know, I, I put him in there and he literally kicks his arms and legs. Like, I'm awesome. Like, yeah, and it's, I mean, but like, it's, it's all the little stuff. Like, um, you know, I think whatever you can make fun out of or make fun. I mean, it's like uh, uh, the girls start jujitsu next week. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're in that. And I'm sure Raiders already doing the uh, martial arts stuff. Absolutely. He loves it. Yeah. And, and it's great because they see the fun. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty good. But, I mean, even the weight training, I mean, like that type of situation, seeing the kids that they come in and, you know, they see the equipment, they see us training. And, is, um, you know, it becomes infectious and part of the culture. So, you know, it's interesting where – um, I had, you know, for me personally, and, and if anybody's listening, if, if you've got a new kid, um, I listened to Raider one day react to something. And um, it was really interesting to me where um, my epiphany as a, as a parent, as a father, I said, you know what, my job, and, and I rededicated myself, I said, my job is to be the best grandfather for Raider's children. Because from that point, when I looked at everything that I do as a human movement science coach was epigenetics, driving epigenetics. What did I pass on to Raider? Well, what is Raider going to pass on to his kids? He's going to do the same things. 
he's going to react to the same things the way that I'm teaching him to react. And it really changed my, my scope as, as a father to sit there and say, you know what? My job is to be the best grandfather that I possibly can because Raider dealing, me dealing with him is how he's going to deal with his kids. Well, you think about how far ahead, I mean, I, 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 I've told this story on this uh, podcast before about, um, you know, when I was fairly young, I wanted to lift weights and my dad told me, uh, it's stupid, it's just counting to 10 over and over again, that's never going to get you anywhere. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I remember. Uh, Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I was like, Thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> it's like, uh, I, I, I was pretty fast when I was uh, younger and then I grew a bunch and I was slow. And I remember like, it was almost like five, fifth and sixth grade. And then all of a sudden I was slow. And I remember I said to my mom, I was like, mom, I, I used to be fast. Like, and now I'm slow. Like what's wrong? And she was like, well, I don't know. And I was like, man, I, I wish somebody could like teach me to run and be faster. And my mom's like, well, that's not a bad idea. And then she asked my dad, my dad's like, I'm not wasting money on that. <laughs> and uh, so like, so like I, I bust his ass on this. He's like, we well, turned out fine. Played 10 years in the NFL. I'm like, I know, but imagine, you know, and, uh, <laughs> That kind of deal where like, you know, now here's a situation where there's actually a little bit of game planning and strategy and it's just not like, hey, go outside and punch your brother in the face for two hours. You know, actually like, you know, now now you have a little bit of a, the Dr. Evil stroking the cat. I'm going to go out and, and absolutely put these opportunities. I mean, you know, you, you think like, like you didn't really get into the organized training for the martial arts until a little bit later in life. Absolutely. And like, you know, and I remember that was a conversation you had. You were like, dude, I why didn't I learn this stuff at three or four years old? Like, why wasn't I in this? I remember, uh, um, you know, like that to me, I mean, and I started martial arts pretty young because, uh, I think my older brother got beat up or something and my dad put us in there. But I mean that, but like, that was just, I don't know, some fucking strip mall martial art bullshit, but actually like the training style, like what, you know, is part of your culture. I mean, to put somebody in that. And I remember we went and trained with those cats that were in Tampa, uh, the, the Filipino guys. I mean, that one dude with the bull whips, Unbelievable. Uh, Ray, so, yeah. Yeah, most scariest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life, watching this guy wield. I mean, those things were, what, 12, 15-foot long bull I think they're 15-footers, to a pair of 15-foot bull whips. A pair. So so the guy was literally, dude, like doing like like whipping, like like snapping things, like pop, like scariest fucking thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm more nervous of uh, 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 guns than watching this dude wield fucking bull whips, like and he snap, snap, snap. I mean, it was unbelievable. And like seeing that level, I mean, and that those guys learned it from the time they were, you know, Raiders age. Yeah. Uh, but being able to to grow up with that level of proficiency is something that you can. I mean, it, it's the Milo Bolt concept. You know, you know, Milo picked up his little calf, and by the time he was a bull, I mean, if you all of a sudden try to go lift the bull after you know doing it. So um, I think now as fathers, what's cool is uh, the girls are just a little bit older than Raider. But, um, you know, now you have the ability to, like, sit back and, like, see all these things and, you know, have all these experiences and being like, okay, like, what information do I need to teach my children to arm them so that they are uh, not only safe but competent members of society and actually young people that I feel comfortable pushing out as my product of my last name. And that's something I wrestle with all the time. Like, as a parent, what am I arming my children with? And we run into people all the time being like, oh, you know, my mom's a drug addict, my dad was an alcoholic, I did, you know, this, and I had to find the way. And I always think, like, uh, you know, is it almost better, like, that type of situation where you let people find their way or you have it's situations like, where you're like... Boy named Sue. Turn him into a man. Yeah, just name him, and you know, I knew I wasn't going to be there, so I named you Sue. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but but then you think about uh, a lot of professional athletes' dads. I mean, I always go back to the uh, Andre Carter and Ruben Carter's dad. His dad knew exactly what what he wanted them to do. He had the kid play basketball. He was a Taekwondo guy. I mean, Olympic lifting, all these things. And next thing you know, he's like, Dad, I want to play some football. He's like, No problem. Give me twenty minutes. And the kid went out and. Uh, you know, Andre went out and played football senior year, gets a scholarship three years later. He's a, you know, top 10 draft pick and plays 14 years in the NFL. And I asked him once, he's like, yeah, it was just like my dad knew what he was doing. He was giving me all the skills that if he wanted it that day, it was available to him, you know? So no, I'm, I'm stoked to see where, uh, where Raider turns out. So what, what do you think? He's got a pension for the water. He's like you, a little fish. I don't know. I don't know. Well, he obviously is going to outgrow me by next year. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Ironically, that's what Kate says because uh, Jamie is pretty much, I think she was like, she's what, like 40 inches tall and Kate uh -huh. like 61 inches tall. And so uh, Jamie is like, 
she's like, in like two years, she's going to be taller than me. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we were laughing because uh, the little man is four months and he weighed 20 pounds. Oh, wow. Uh, um, at his, his deal yesterday. And so Kate's holding him and people are like, it's a big baby. She's like, oh, thank God he fucking took after his father and not after me. I'm a shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Um, you know what? I, I um, I've learned from my experiences in my career. I'm not going to push him into anything. Uh, just like you, uh, he loves gymnastics. He loves martial arts. He does that every morning, and um, he loves swimming. And and that's about the extent of it. And I don't even push him into any of those. It's you know he just goes, when are we swimming today? When do we get to swim? Um, and from my experiences, I've learned. Um, you know, from specialization where all these parents are trying to drive um, high achieving athletes at such a young age. You know, I, I vowed, Steph and I vowed to, to not be that person. And I'm, you know, I'm like, you know what, 18 years old, that's, that's my goal. I want to see you as a comprehensive, you know, total complete athlete, athlete. Yeah. at 18 years old. And I don't care what you do with it. Yeah. The, the, the complete athlete, it's almost like, um, I think people are focusing on developing skills what I'm trying to do is is develop almost like uh, give them like a diverse skill set. Like, mm -hmm. like, and, and I uh, years ago, I think it was Kelly Starrett and I had a pretty cool conversation. He was like, "Well, if you can break things down into skills," and I was like, "You know what? Like uh, something that involves a ball and stick, so there's hand-eye coordination. Something involves swimming, different orientations." Uh, like a swimming or, you know, something that teaches body awareness, like gymnastics, or, you know, you kind of go through and you can kind of peg these different ones. But uh, if you can give people or give your kids that opportunity to, to master these different skill sets, uh, they should be universally applicable towards any sport that they want to use it for. And I think like, uh, you know, to me, uh, I, I much rather have the best athlete possible and then be like, what do you like? What are you going to be good at? What do you want to do more so than like me deciding well, that yeah. you're going to lo learn to throw? You know, you're only going to be good at this. Yeah. You're a pitcher. But I mean, that, that, that's also too, uh, um, like we said, people fail at the margin of experience. You have parents that are trying to relive their own like mm -hmm. gymnastics. I sit next to this guy who, you know, there with his daughter and he's trying to tell me he's got his eight year old son in tackle football because he always regretted and felt he could have been better at football if he could have learned to hit at a younger age. Oh. This is what the guy fucking told me. So he puts his son in tackle football at eight years old, and it's like, yeah, I feel like if I can get him in there early, he'll uh, he'll learn to hit and like to hit, and he'll have a better career. And I was like, really? That's pretty ironic. And he's like, why? I'm like, because I didn't play till I was 14, and um, and when I got to high school, and hitting was no big deal, and all the guys that I played with at that age all burned out. Mm -hmm. yep. he's like, oh. And he's like, well, what, what, what do you think he should do? And I was like, well, you bring your daughter to gymnastics. Why don't you bring your son to gymnastics? Mm -hmm. I was like, uh, if I was a eight or uh, if I was a you know seventh or eighth or ninth grade boy, and uh, I wanted to be better at sport, I'd be here at gymnastics. And that thing's packed with chicks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's where I would have been freshman in high school. I mean, I probably would have been scared to death to walk in there. But goddamn, <laughs> it's all these really you know fucking fit fucking girls that are in their bus and their ass. Like there's like six dudes in there. <laughs> but you said it best. It's it's the burnout, and that's the part where where most parents and most coaches don't understand is, um, you know, win the war, allow the athletes more time under the bar, allow more time on the track, allow more time on the field, so that they can fix things, that they can find th fine tune things. Uh, did you guys watch the USA Track and Field? It was the yes. I want to say the eight hundred. I didn't watch it. Was, uh, it was uh, Kate Grace. And the most amazing thing was um, that was where the, the, the two girls tripped each other and they fell. I didn't and see so, that. So basically our one and two, in, in the, it was either the 1500 or the 800, but they tripped each other and they both went tumbling. And um, they fell and the girl that won, Kate Grace, um, as they're interviewing them, um, the most profound thing, she stands up there and she goes, I have never podiumed in high school. I've never podiumed in college. I've never podiumed as a, as a professional. And here I am as the United States Olympic trials champion. And it was just amazing because to sit there and think that you just buy your time. If you stay in the sport long enough, you know, you're going to show, you know, you demonstrate enough grit. Eventually things will start to sharpen down the road versus, I mean, swimming is notorious. You look at the, the record books and like how many eight to nine you know, eight to 10 year olds are awesome and dominating and they're going to be the next Michael Phelps. And 
that's it. That's the last you hear of them. You know, the next thing you know, they're burnt out. They never want to swim again. So uh, just always revisiting that coming back to, you know, win the war, win the war kind of issue. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Dave? Did you want to get? Uh, yeah, I got one more fun question. I had the opportunity to uh, sit for a certification. I had to write a program, but I wrote it not for their language. I wrote it as if I was giving it to to John and you, and that left a lot of opportunity to explain some movements. And one in which I had to explain, and they enjoyed, was the the Kadaya killers. So nice. I, I totally the, fucked that one up, dude. When you sent it to me, and I texted Roth immediately because I never like. I didn't know where the name, like, uh, you know, Roth had to educate me. <laughs> and actually, I had spelled it differently over the years. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, phonetically, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, the, and then if we look on Google, there's nothing. So, this story, I, I believe it's just, I don't know if it's a, kind of a fairy tale with you or it, it actually happened. Uh, most I think Roth, Roth was, about, yeah, wasn't he like, like uh, underwater, found a treasure chest, um, opened it up, and then. Uh, <laughs> <for it>. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a ring. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, the Kadaya ring. What? The Kadaya ring. Well, no, it was the ring to rule no, no, other rings. Kadaya was killed. That's why they call him. Okay. Kadaya uh -huh. killers. Yeah, the Kadaya killers. So, if, if you want to enlighten our viewers with the history of the, the, the Kadaya killers. The Kadaya killer was actually um, a therapist. Uh, that was his name, Kadaya. Um, and this was whatever, 20 years ago when we, we, we decided to do these things. Um, we wanted to work with boxers. One of the things that um, the therapists used to see a lot, of, um, a lot of fighters, and they noticed that the knuckles of the old fighters were flat. They weren't like spaghetti. So the tendons that were across, um, that they had actually flattened like you know lasagna, like fettuccine would. Um, and so I said, well, is there something that we could do because they would start to fray um, over time? The boxers just constantly repetitively punching and they said, well, you know, basically we have to figure a way to use those muscles. Um, and then we started to figure out, um, we combined that researching tennis elbow and golfer's elbow and we found that there was a, uh, there was a very distinct um, relationship between the two. So we started to figure out. Uh, we need to work on more extension um, at multiple planes from a flex wrist, from an extended wrist, um, versus, as well as from a flex wrist and extended wrist from a bent elbow. Um, and then eventually we just started to go overhead because it just felt terrible. Um, but it's <laughs> the best was uh, when we would do the Kadaya Killer. Well, there, there was a couple funny ones. It was uh, the Kadaya Killers and then Rob's uh, TheraBand uh, isometric hold shoulder routine. Mm -hmm. So there's like, and you guys have, so yeah, yeah. yeah, we've gone through and I've shown you guys, uh, but uh, we would have people come like at a train with us and like there'd be some paraban and just some opening of the hands and dudes would literally be shaking. So, like, <laughs> like tears streaming down the face. Like uh, one, one of my favorite moments was when David Boston came and trained with us. <laughs> oh, David B. Dude. First of all, the guy shows up. I mean, his fucking chest. That's huge. Like, it was unreal. Fucking quads. Fucking and that was in his heyday when he was the, the premier wide receiver for Miami. I mean, he was 240 pounds, would you say? Yeah. 240? Oh, yeah. Like, uh, stacked. I, I've i never in my life seen an NFL football player uh, from the front that put together. But when he turned from the back, he had, like, no hamstring, no ass, no butt, and no fucking back. Like, he was traps, chest, abs, quads. Mm -hmm. I mean, What about biceps? Oh, fuck oh, yeah. Amazing oh, yeah. oh, yeah. it, it looked like something like, like but it was crazy because he was biceps and no fucking tricep. Oh, yeah. So it was like it, it was the weirdest thing. Like this dude came in and I was like, holy shit. And then he like turned to the side and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean dude, he, he he didn't last with us but a few minutes. Yeah, he's. I, I think we ended up uh, going through maybe one cycle, and then he was like, "I'm out." You know, and I, even Jamie Duncan and I laugh about it to this day. Where we talk about when when David Boston came in, and we we're like, you know, plays like you know, in the weight room, not necessarily on the field, but it's one of those, you know, it looks like Tarzan plays like Jane kind of issues, and we were like, "Wow!" And then it was that first uh, he went to camp, and he blew out his patella tendons. Yeah. Oh, shit. So. oh yeah, he, uh, I mean, like, it, it, it's pretty interesting, like, uh, yeah, I always think, like, with the hamstring, is it chicken or egg? 
You know, like if uh, do you, you know, like, like hamstring is really, you know, causes, uh, you know, the prevents tibial torsion. And then you think about like deceleration, like the, you know, the you tear ACLs and you have all these problems with, with this kind of shit, the, you know, tibial slide and the hamstring being like Ross said, like that spring that really slows it down. So it's like, uh, if you don't change, if you don't decelerate, do you develop hamstrings? Or do you not be or able do you to lack hamstrings? Or do you lack hamstrings, what prevents you from decelerating? Mm -hmm. And like you always think about, like you know, uh, if you think about training the hamstring in two different ways, you can either curl it, which like a like a leg curl, mm -hmm. or you can like an RDL or a deadlift or something, which is effectively like lengthening, like you know. And you think about uh, which one is more beneficial in terms of deceleration. What do you think? How about? You think so? Eccentric. 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 <coughs> what do you think, Ralph? Eccentric load. Yeah, being able to do some form of whether it be everything, because you think about the biggest function of the hamstring is being able to to really lengthen under tension. So you think about like all these different movements that people use, and it's like you know how do you use your hamstring? That's why for me, uh, I didn't pull a deadlift off of the ground for the majority of my NFL career, but we used to RDL heavy as fuck, mm -hmm. and it was always well, you're eccentrically loading both hip and knee. Yeah, but uh, we would always start from an up position, and it was eccentrically loading into it right. with a dynamic concentric. Whereas, like, you know, you think about a deadlift is what? You concentric. know, yes. concentric or eccentric. If you fucking don't dump it. If you don't dump it. So, like, when people ask me, like, what about the deadlift? I'm like, yeah, deadlifting's fine. But, like, for what I needed it for, the deadlift didn't pay dividends the mm -hmm. way that a, a top position RDL into it paid for me. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, because of the stress of that, but then also once you do it, what type of movements are you doing to, you know, do it, whether it be change of direction, slowing down. I mean, a lot of those, that, a lot of that type of stuff, I mean, people forget they sprint, but they don't worry about actually the deceleration. I mean, that's something we work on the time, sprint as fast as you can, and you have to decelerate within a certain amount. Yeah. And how do you kind of like bring your legs and then basically stop and, you know, be able to go through it. So. Yeah. It was really interesting where one of the major considerations when we're doing Roy Birch's rehab was um, as he progressed into being able to dive off of the blocks, his hamstrings were dominant knee flexors, mm -hmm. um, which really didn't allow us to produce any, I mean, you know, the, the whole point of a block is to create speed and then the stroke is actually carrying the speed over. Um, and we weren't allowed to, to build any speed off of the block because the moment that the foot came off, um, everything was about the knee basically was flexing. So if I'm here, the moment he pushed off, the foot would just kind of poke up in the air like a big orca fin yeah. uh, versus, you know, extending and trying to get that full hip extension. So it took us a long time to re-educate that hamstring to be a hip extender and a knee, um, you know, to, to hold that knee in place and, and extend the hip versus allowing that entire segment to collapse. I mean, it took a long, long time to get that in. I mean, it basically was a year process to get him from being a knee flexor to a hip extender. Wow, it's good stuff. But yeah. Well, Rafa, got anything else to throw in for for the crowd? I mean, uh, if they want to know where to reach you or check out, I mean, where can they find you? Just type in some search term. <laughs> and it, I thought we were going to talk about the Olympics. Oh, yeah, we uh, didn't even talk. Yeah, well, yeah they're, they're coming up, right? Yeah, well, yeah. No, yeah. That'll those, be a good time. Up. Well, thanks for yeah. <laughs> hey, that. Get you back on. Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll do an Olympic thing. And now uh, we were sitting here and uh, started telling some re stories. I'm like, let's see. I, I bet she's but ready for bed. I'll tell you, uh, when I travel, I do use Raph's program. I've chimed in a little bit on the feed in that. There's nothing better for twist and bending and getting out of your comfort zone than to train heroically. Dude, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of bendy, which is good. Yes. I mean, yeah, that's what you need. The problem is, is that you have to have Raphael's Rosetta Stone, which is, you know, <laughs> yeah, like there's – well, like he, you know, he writes in hieroglyphics, and I'm like, fuck, I got to translate this thing from Egyptian to Greek. To English, I mean, it's and back again, and then back again. So yeah, uh, Tex walks around. I mean, here, here's the best that Tex travels with this thing, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's good. Just in case, we need, we need to do a refresher, Tex. We need to come in. We got a lot of new stuff for you. I don't, I don't got a home. Did you see? Uh, <laughs> did you see as he said, he kind of like looked away, which meant but, uh, no. Uh, here's what he said: <laughs> Tex, you should totally come in, and uh, I, I survived. So he failed, so I got to go back. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, all, all I'm imagining is Ruff showing up in Austin and being the Colorado River and being like, Tex, we're going to swim the Colorado River. Tex. No, no, he won't even tell me. He's going to appear. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to swim like in Mr. jeans and boots. Like, yeah, like jeans and boots and a cowboy hat, and he's going to swim it. You're going to be fucking grounded. When are you looking at going to uh, Austin? Uh, we, uh, we sold the house, so, um, we closed August 1, and, uh, we rented a place down the street, so we signed, uh, five months, and so we're out of there December 31st, so, uh, we're gonna hopefully here Skip Christmas? No, well, I don't know what we're gonna do. Oh, uh, I thought you were gonna try to get there before school so that you... No, 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 we gotta clean out some stuff, we still gotta, like, you know, uh, figure out the leases here, and kind of, you know, like, prepare... To yeah, move but the really, business side of it. Yeah, the business side, which I mean, really, the big one was, uh, you know, selling the house, and we kind of had it on the market, and then we had the baby, and we put it up, and we had it up for a few weeks, and we had a um, some dude who showed up in a matte black convertible Lamborghini, one, and uh, wanted to write a check that day if we moved out, and we were like, uh, okay, and <laughs> so that was it, and so he uh, wanted it more than we wanted it, so I was kind of like, all right, but time, time to go. So yeah, we've been. Uh, it's kind of exciting, you know, the idea of uh, going somewhere new, new frontier. Oh uh, yeah, it's a new adventure. I mean, like I've been, you know, I, I grew up out here. I've lived out here. I owned a home here since 2003, but literally started here full time 2008. So I've mean, been out here for eight years, and uh, I think um, being able to go someplace new and see something new, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, just a new set of experiences. I'm, I'm uh, you know, but like. Hey, I think I got used to that in the NFL. Like, um, you know, I went to college up north, and you go out to Philly, and we lived in Tampa, and then went to Kansas City, and, you know, you get to see different places, and I think, like... Cabin fever. Yeah, I'm on, yeah. Uh, you know, it's time to move again, you know? Oh, and, uh, right there, right? Standing water. Standing water is filled with disease, so mm -hmm. I don't do this. I mean, Rob, shit, you've been in Tampa for years, and you got a chance to go up to North Carolina, and, you know, who knows, you might end up back in Texas one of these days. I might. I might. Could very well do so. Yeah, I know that would be uh, uh that, that would be awesome. Now, I, I you know what like uh, it's there was always a dream to have like a bigger piece of property. I always wanted to like wake up and not see my fucking neighbor's fence, like, like or their window. Yeah, I don't know, like, that, like on my side. Yeah, like, like I look out my windows and it's just my neighbor's windows. <laughs> and, so and, you're like, <laughs> and then you're kind of like. Oh, like I like to wake up and actually see some nature or see something other than my neighbor's fence or their, their window. And or hearing my neighbor, you know, fucking hack up a lung one morning. I'm like, oh, you got a hacker too? Yeah. Dude, I've got the best hacker, like the wheeziest long cough. <laughs> like, I'm a fucking movie. <laughs> For like two hours, starting at like 5 a.m. And it's just like, it's a stop. Uh, so it doesn't, like, it won't wake you up or anything. But if you go outside and drink some coffee, you'll hear him, like, in his house just doing this wheeze. I'm like, man, he's got a Maserati and a Porsche SUV, though. Well, I mean, and, uh, and one of, uh, yeah. What are the what are the Fisker right? Oh, he's got a Karma Fisker. Yeah. Wow. He he must be you know that cough. I mean, <laughs> holy shit, very good. I don't know, dude. It's it's uh, I, I realized when the dude pulled up in a convertible matte black Lambo uh, that uh, I probably I'm like you know what my wife's like time to go this 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 you know I have Orange County's not for us anymore so. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll we'll figure out the move. I mean, we got to figure out how to. I mean, good good thing I got these guys. You know rearing to go but uh go there and try to figure out some business i gotta find a place for the kids and um you know i mean shit I, and they're you, you know like they were pretty sad today they were like i can't believe we gotta leave leave our house and this and this is where i grew up and all this and i was like just settle the fuck down <laughs> like don't get fucking dramatic on me dude. like they're like oh, we're not gonna have a pool i'm like dude the fact that you guys are four years old and play about the pool we'll go to the fucking beach and yeah like, oh yeah we like the beach i'm like yeah no shit let's go like, <laughs> I know they. they uh, yeah, uh, I was just happy if I got dinner when I was a kid. Oh, now hey, man. You know, now I got the. How, how your mom and dad? Are they good? They're awesome. They actually just left. I saw the picture on Facebook of uh, of your mom and pop and Raider and uh, Roger. Yeah, yeah. Roger actually went. Um, him and Teresa's wife uh, left here the same day, but they drove to Miami. Um, hated it. They said this is not what we thought. They, I think they spent. They're supposed to spend like a, a number of days there, but they're like, they're blown out of town. So then they just drove down to the Keys to spend more time down at the Keys, and then they're going to swing back up, come stay with me again for a couple more days before they head back to uh, San Antonio. Are you, are you playing with a knife as you? That's a fake just, knife. It's a fake knife. It's a fake. It's, it's Raider's training knife. 
Oh, very so, nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty sword. Can I give it to my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> Big 13 wear. All right, Rob. Well, hey, bro. Thank, thanks. Uh, we'll have to get you back on for our uh, Olympic review. So that was Definitely. Yeah, I swear we'll talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was a it was a really interesting learning experience of, uh, in terms of the politics of it. So um, I think I learned um, and, and uh, reviewed and and it it solidified a lot of my ideas. I, I was thinking that swimming was um, was different than any other pro sport, and it's um, and, and it's just the same. It is just the same as, as as everything else. Where when it comes to you know the professional elite level. Yeah, it's the uh, you know all the training in the in the world is is great, but at the end of the day, the the best in the world, the best in the world, could do the best in the world. They are gifted, um, uh, rarely, and I don't know if you guys watch swimming um, immediately become Katie Ledecky fans. If you get a chance, Katie Ledecky, she is um, currently in the eight hundred meter swim. She, uh, she failed to qualify in the two hundred. Um, Last year, she won the 200, 400, 800, and the mile. Um, yeah, which is unheard of. So just imagine that those regards in track and field, if somebody were to win. Yeah, she's a ginger. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're looking her up. It's her favorite swimmer. I mean, we, why wouldn't we know this stuff? Yeah, and she better. is. Uh, she comes from a great family, um, uh, tied into apparently the uh, wonderful Ledecky. family. The, 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 She's young. She was. Uh, Ledecky she was fortune. The Ledecky fortune. She was, uh, uh, I think, the youngest gold medalist from the last Olympics. Sure. But um, currently, she is the most. She potentially, um, you know, as non-swimming fans. She is the most dominant athlete of, of our generation, more than more than Michael Phelps. Like um, in the one of the events, like the four hundred, the eight hundred, she owns the top ten fastest times ever swam. Oh wow! Um, currently, she is I want to say six seconds faster than the next person in the world. Like it's not even it's yeah. not even close. Like like Ledecky is here and, and the world is, is not even in the same picture as her. She is an absolute, um, she's, she's kind of revolutionizing the way that, that females swim. You know, when you watch her, she's got a big loping kind of swim. She swims like a guy. She breathes every stroke. Um, and she swims like a sprinter who just happens to continue swimming. It, it's, it's absolutely amazing to watch. So, Look for that, you know. You know, when, as Rio comes around, even though the it's going to be the Michael Phelps show, but really, Katie Ledecky is 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 the thing to watch. So, are, are you going to go? Oh God, no! I didn't. Um, I, honestly, I didn't think I. Uh, even though I posted that, where, you know, where they they put the uh, support team, I knew um, because I I had uh, ruffled too many feathers. Uh, there were too many. You? I did. No. It was uh, <laughs> it was interesting because um, you know working with one of our swimmers, uh, he the swimmer confided in me that they always um, have an injury to their groin any time, um, at least once or twice a year. Um, I did an evaluation. I did a little movement evaluation. Um, we put him on a program. Uh, he did probably two or three sessions, and he was like that. He goes the exact spot. He goes, that, what we're working right now, that is, is where I always injure. Um, and then uh, because the purse strings come down from USA Swimming, uh, they came down, they evaluated, they watched a session, and um, they, they immediately pulled the plug. They said, they said what, uh, what you're doing right there with RAF, immediately stop. Um, when we judge USA Swimming, our U.S. swimmers versus the swimmers in the world, uh, we're not as strong as them. Um, so really focus in on let's get their squat up, let's get their bench up. And um, I remember in, in a closed door meeting, you know, waiting for a punchline. I was waiting for like, ha ha, joke, blah, 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 but it never happened. So, um, and consequently at the trials, the swimmer injured the exact same spot that, uh, that, that, that we didn't address. So um, that became a very big sore spot and um, that cascaded into a, a pretty nasty road between me and USA Swimming. So just it sucks. Yes. It's, well, it's the politics. It's the part yeah. that that I don't do well with. Is, is the yeah, politics. Right. Like I want to help the athlete. Just you know, turn me loose. I'm a pit bull. Let me do my job. Uh, but then when you start getting all of the other things in, involved, that's where 
that I have problems with. The dirty side. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, fuck, dude. I mean, these are... Uh, you know, it's a business, man. It's well, fucking... No, no, I mean, uh, the, the Olympics are, uh, you know, such a fucking machine. And, and, you know, not only in donations and this idea of, you know, hey, we got to, you know, support America, USA Swim. I mean, you know, look at all the teams. I mean, fuck, I was yesterday at gymnastics. They were, you know, fucking donate to USA Gymnastics. Mm. I mean, you know, and it's our deal to do this. I mean, it's it's really, uh, you know, uh, this idea of, uh, you know, show your loyalty to your country by somehow giving money to these uh, innocuous organizations that you don't really know who we're the head of. But, you know, fuck, it's not going to the athletes. So, I mean, I don't know. Shit, but professional sports, dude. Any other name? I, I just, I just wish that you know you have the athletes at the at the top of their game, and they are the highest pinnacle of of what we have as as quote unquote uh, Olympic sports that that they would receive you know the best training possible. Um, and it's and just like you said, John, it's it's really you know the most gifted will always outrightly win versus everybody else, no matter what you you know, no matter the level of training that that the rest of us common people would do. Well, there you have it. Words of wisdom. Done. Thanks, so, Ruff. Ruiz, what's your, what's your website now? RaffRuiz.com. Simple. Can't, yeah, can't get, can't get away from that one. Finally, <laughs> something easy to find. <laughs> Oh, so listen up, monkeys out there. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, go check out RaffRuiz.com. And I know he's all over Facebook, tons of media and stuff, too. And then if you're on Train Heroic, check out Train Heroically. Right? What else, Ruff? Anything else? Tampa. Um, that's about it. Yeah. Come to Tampa where, um, um, I think, uh, did, open swim. did we hook, uh, Austin up with Ruff? Uh, or is I, that, I believe, uh, Austin's in point port outside of Sarasota. He's yeah, in port. Uh, one, one of our kids got, uh, drafted by the devil or by, by the Rays. And by the Rays. He's been out there two, three weeks and he just got moved up to single A ball. Yeah. So he was in developmental on this and now he's in high single A. And he was trying to explain it to me, like, the nine levels. I'm like, all right, well, when do you get to double A? He's like, this is the one right below double A, and then I get to triple A, and then that's the, the yeah, pro. So big he, show. he kind of catapulted through, like, five different levels, I guess, pretty fast. Mm -hmm. He's a he's a big pitcher. And, uh, and Raf, talk about a guy who, like, you don't know what you don't know when it comes to, like, training. This fucking kid came in. He's a moron. Like, Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> like, <laughs> he, he is a... Uh, but the good uh, thing about him, like, a humble, like, humbly, like... Well, he... He was, uh, put it like this, if you had a, uh, like, a, about half as smart as John McLaughlin. <laughs> about half as smart as Johnny Mac. Uh, but you know what, like, I, and I remember having a conversation with him, like, you're, and I, not to be rude, but I was like, uh, Austin, you're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. He's like, I know I'm an idiot. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, but that's all right, because you know that. Like, mm -hmm. like I, you know, as long as you don't, as long as you know what you don't know, we're, we're good. And, and I was like, your best bet is to throw a baseball for as long as you can and basically put off the real world by playing a <laughs> game. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, so we're going to train your ass. You're going to fucking do everything. You're going to like suck this thing up and like go out and throw the ball as hard as you can. He goes, I'm going to do this so that you don't have to come get a real job. Yeah. And he's like, I, I, I love it. He goes, I, I, I don't do whatever you say. Do. Yeah. And he, he literally did whatever. And he made some really, really phenomenal games to where he was out throwing 94, 95 for the, for the scouts. And, you know, Six. Yeah. Yeah. Through 96. And he, wow. uh, he, he told me, he was like, uh, I said, how's it going? He's like, man, he goes, I've, I've been uh, knocking out saves left and right. I guess he had three saves in like four nights. Yeah, I saw that. And then they moved him right up. And uh, so now he's going to keep getting the opportunity. So it's really nice, too, because he actually had a pitching coach, which he never had before. Oh, no shit. Yeah, because so he, he didn't get really get a uh, coach uh, ever. And so now, you know, you know, his first opportunity where he goes, he's like, we actually have pitching drills. And, like, it's just not like go throw that fucker as hard as you can. Wow, good so for I'm him! Pretty excited. Mm -hmm. so and the Rays, the Rays have a great minor league program. It's one of the best in Major League Baseball. They do a fantastic job of of developing the young guys. You know, some guys they, they just bring them in, and be like, "Hey, we'll draft Joe Schmo and just fill up a draft roster." And then, but we know the guys that are going to play. The Rays do a phenomenal job of trying to get the guys to crawl up through the ranks. So he's in a good program. He's in a oh, really that's great. Good, yeah, so, yeah. yeah he, he's in what, what's it Port. Just inside Sarasota, it's uh, not um, Port. Oh, I can't remember. That's where he is. But yeah, he said he's about four. Oh, what's Sarasota? An hour and a half, ninety minutes. Yeah, about an hour. Yeah, about an hour. So, 
Didn't Ed Murray Tullo used to live in uh, Sarasota? Yeah, I used to make the drive up every day in the Toyota Avalon. Yeah. <laughs> big 400 pound Samoan man cruising up 275 in an Avalon. Ah, oh, fucking big fucker. Love that guy. He's, yeah. um, I, I, when I was in North Carolina, I had um, uh, dinner with, with Jeff a couple of times, him and his wife, and he said Ed has moved back to Samoa. Oh, shit. Yeah, he's up there. He's like a teacher, and, and he's you know, living the, the Samoan life again. Wow. And apparently he, there was uh, maybe a little bit of mismanagement of, of, of funds between, you know, the, within the Samoan culture, it's all familial. So it's like, you know, I got to take care of everybody. So, you know, that paycheck tends to, to, to run thin when you've got, you know, 50 member family to try to take. Yeah. 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 Fuck. Damn. So. Good. Raph, we had uh, Ron McKeefrey on a few weeks ago. Ronnie! Yeah. So uh, we, we dropped your name and he had some good things to say. He is a, you know what? I did he, uh, first of all, I didn't know that he didn't. I just found out that him and Mark, you know, you know kind of butted heads um, because for the longest time I thought he was Mark's boy. And that's why I really didn't spend much time with Ronnie. But um, I think it was recently, a couple of years back, you know, he, he had mentioned it in, in some other interview that uh, that they didn't really get it wrong. And, and because that's the same experience that I had in the NFL with dealing with the Sonovich where he tried to throw the, you know, the, the high intensity training physiology on me. And I remember sitting in the meeting like, no, that's BS, that's BS, that's BS. Um, but did he tell you about when he was at USF? Um, and, and this is the part where I had the most amount of respect for him, where, you know, his, you his, his athlete died. Oh, no, no, he didn't share that. Yeah, that's um, – we, we talked after that where uh, um, he was one of the um, – uh, basically they came in off of summer conditioning and they came in to work out. One of the other coaches was hoorah rying, um, you know, apparently a, a kid that needed a lot of hoorah rying. And um, the kid fell out, and Ronnie was the one that started the CPR process. And um, so basically, he had an athlete die in his arms. Um, and and he, he was really shaken up about it. And, and from that moment on, um, you know, him and I you know, started to, to talk a lot more because that, I mean, that that scared the crap out of me. I remember because we have the ability and we have a tendency to become grinders um, and, and we'll get after it. And a lot of coaches in this field, if you're a coach's coach, you will get excited when, you know, when that hoorah rah and that energy starts to build up. Um, but then you forget the, the negative consequences. And I think he, he had to, to live through one of the worst possible experiences in, of any coach. And that's to have an athlete, you know, basically die of, uh, I think he had congenital heart disease um, that was, that wasn't, um, never red flagged. And, um, and basically, like I said, I couldn't imagine sitting there doing CPR on the guy as he, as he loses his life right there on your platform. So um, from then on, I was always, you know, uh, take it a lot more serious because, you know, one, I'm sure he didn't wake up that day and be like, yeah, hey, I wonder if somebody's going to die. Right. Um, last, yeah. last thing on your mind. So, um, you know, I, I think of him all the time when, you know, when um, you know, make sure that we've got the right precautions and things like that of, of trying to be a little bit safer than stupid. But good kid, really, really good guy. And I'm, I'm glad to see his, his CEO book is doing well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's great dad, Martin. Solid dude. Yeah. yeah. All right, Ruiz. Thanks, brother. All right. Thanks. Right, take care, Ralph. Nice talking thanks, to you. Yep. Later. Bye. 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 Now it's time for you to empower your performance. RAF is forever inspiring athletes of various skill levels, sports backgrounds, and ages. Benefit from his constant flow of information by following him on Instagram at s 3 rafferies That's S, the number three, R-A-P-H-R-U-I-Z. Until next time. <laughs>